All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I will uh, call us back to order here and note that we are holding uh, tonight's adjourned meeting as a continuation of our regular meeting from Tuesday, September 8th. Uh, we left off at business item 7.13 on our agenda. That's an update on our school reopening plan. So we will begin there tonight. Uh, and I'd just like to note again that we are holding this meeting uh, virtually uh, pursuant to the emergency ordinance TO 20-12 adopted by the city council on April 6th. And the emergency ordinance allows for the school board to meet electronically in order to, in order to address continuity of operations associated with COVID-19 pandemic. Our electronic meetings are still open to the public. Uh, there was an opportunity for the public to submit public comments to be read at the meeting this past Tuesday. September 8th, and the agenda for this meeting is, uh, this evening's meeting is the agenda from Tuesday and is available on board docs. Um, before we actually start on item 7.13, I'd like to ask Ms. Goodell to call the roll so that we can document the quorum present for tonight's meeting. Okay, Dr. Anderson. Here. Uh, Dr. Dimmick, I don't believe is here. Ms. Downs. Here. Ms. Litton. Here. Mr. Reitinger. Here. Ms. Russell? Here. And Mr. Webb? Mr. Webb just joined. Yeah, I think he's joining. Mr. Webb, you're in. Thank you. I'm here. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so tonight's first item on our agenda is an update on the school reopening plan. Um, Dr. Noonan and his team have a presentation for us. And just so everyone kind of knows how I'd like to, to carry this section forward, we're going to the, the presentation is divided into five segments, and after each segment, we'll pause uh, for questions from members uh, uh, from the board. And what I will do is, as we have done before on these sorts of things, I'll go around uh, just down the list of members present uh, alphabetically, and then we'll go in reverse alphabetical order the next time. But we'll do that, just ask a couple of questions from each person until we get all the way uh, through the questions from, uh, from everyone on that segment. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next, and that way uh, we can get questions and, and presentation together. Uh, at the end, there'll be obviously an opportunity to ask any other questions that need to be dealt with, uh, and folks want to have the answers to. So, um, and uh, with that, uh, I'm looking forward to tonight's presentation. And Dr. Noonan, I'd like to turn this over to you. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to see you tonight. Um, first things. First, I uh, just wanted to give you all an update that, uh, and happy to report um, that um, the, the young person in my house um, has been released from the hospital and is at home and uh, resting comfortably. So I appreciate the flexibility on Tuesday night. Uh, and I apologize I wasn't here. I, I needed to tend to that family emergency. And um, one, appreciate your uh, support, um, the comments that you've uh, sent, but also really want to recognize um, the team that are from FCCPS that are on the call this evening as well and thank them for um, really chipping in and, and pinch hitting um, for the last couple of days. They've been extremely um, supportive and uh, extremely helpful. And, and as you can tell, um, I think we, uh, well, we know we have a very, very capable team here that's been able to step up and step in. So. Um, specifically, Kristen and William, Rebecca Sharp, um, Trisha Minson, uh, John Brett, and and the team. So and Marty, thank you very much for for chipping in. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and get started. Um, I am going to actually, uh, Dr. Anderson, I'm going to minimize the um, screen with you all, so I may not be able to see you while we're presenting. Um, so if there is indeed sometime before the sort of logical breaks in the presentation, a need or desire to ask a question and uh, you need to interrupt, just let me know um, so I can hear you um, because then I can, I can make the, the break. All right. So we'll um, this evening, yeah, this evening, really what we are um, hoping to do, actually, Kristen, if you can just go back for a second, is really um, just talk a little bit about the, the measures and metrics um, with respect to uh, reopening our schools. And I want to um, start with just sort of a little bit of information for the board and a little bit of information for the community to help provide some context um, to where we are and, and how we got here. And I, obviously, I won't go into all the details of, of how we got here. I think everybody's pretty aware of that. Um, but one of the things that uh, 
we have been doing all summer has, has been planning for um, our reopenings in a variety of different scenarios. And so I wanna make sure that um, the board and the public know that um, throughout the summer, we've been planning for a hybrid. We had also been planning for potentially uh, more full-time face-to-face and kind of at the uh, 11th hour, if you will, um, not, not because we were uh, falling in line with anyone else. It was just because the data was starting to turn in a direction that uh, we as a school organization just didn't feel comfortable with. We obviously made the shift to an all, line, all online approach, um, which then took the time and resources to begin developing that a little bit sooner than we anticipated that we needed to do that. So I, I wanna just make sure everybody understands in the community and the board that we have been certainly working on all of these different uh, varieties of scenarios since the very beginning of the summer and even into last spring. Um, and as we've moved into the online environment, one of the things that we found ourselves in a position of needing to do is think about now, how do we move from an online environment back into a hybrid approach um, now that we had made the decision to move to online? And as we began to think about it, and as we began to talk about it with our staff and with our community and with some of our students, one of the things that became uh, incredibly clear right from the beginning was that we needed to, at, at every opportunity, engage our staff in what that would look like for us to be able to come back um, to a hybrid scenario from an online scenario. So. Um, as I think everybody here knows, we haven't had our staff on contract until uh, the last part of August. Um, we've now started our, uh, we're uh, in our third week of school. And so we've needed to go back to our staff and engage our staff and what would that um, return from online to hybrid look like for a number of reasons. One is um, I, I don't want to, and I don't think it's good um, leadership to engage in any kind of top-down leadership where I say, uh, to the staff, this is what we're going to do, like it or lump it. Um, I really am hopeful that our staff can utilize their creativity and their thoughtfulness to help us engage really powerful ways to bring back students. Um, and we needed just some time to be able to work with our staff. And then the last piece that I want to just provide is further context is, um, I know several of our surrounding jurisdictions have put out uh, some uh, gradual return plans with some dates on them. Um, and what I'm learning from my colleagues is that those dates uh, were done several weeks before teachers returned. And I think some of us, at least in, on the call, and some of you may have seen um, some of the pushback from the staff relative to um, those dates. And part of that is a consequence, I believe, of not completely engaging the faculty in what the return to school plan would look like. So uh, while you may see some surrounding jurisdictions that have some dates that are out there, I'm not necessarily sure um, that one, they will meet them or two, that they've had an opportunity to really deeply engage. So I would go back to something that um, we talked about early in the process, and that is that sometimes we need to go slow to go fast. And so right now, um, while it may feel that, that we are going relatively slowly with respect to returning students back to school, um, I can assure the board that um, as we do this, because we already have a pretty good sense of what a hybrid can look like, because that's what we were planning all summer for, um, while we may go slow now, over the course of the next several months, I think that we'll be able to pick up some speed. Um, but we're not going to do that in isolation, and we are going to do it with our, our teachers and our staff in mind, uh, and our community and our students. So Kristen, now we can go ahead and, and go forward. So let me frame the um, conversation tonight. Um, Dr. Anderson began to do that. Thank you very much for it, um, to give you a sense of kind of where we're, we're going um, to go. And first, I want to give credit where credit is due, and that is to our staff. Um, we, we have extraordinary teachers. We have extraordinary paras. We have extraordinary food service, transportation, custodial services, uh, you name it from top to bottom. Everyone has chipped in daycare and the like. Um, to, to make the system work for us as we opened in our online environment. And I just wanna take a, a moment to thank them. Um, but we're here tonight to really review um, the metrics and measures for reopening our schools. And that is, um, to be quite frank, a little bit of a sticky wicket. And I'll, I'll, I'll happily explain what I mean as we move through the presentation. Um, so part of the reason though, that it is a bit of a sticky wicket is 
it's, it's not as easy as just saying the health data says this and we're gonna return our kids to school. Um, or all of our teachers, we've done a survey and all of our teachers have said, bring our kids back. It's not as simple as just administering a survey of who's willing to come back and then going forward. It's a, a nuanced and multifaceted approach to uh, returning. So this evening, you're gonna hear our presentation in sort of three parts. The first is we wanna talk a lot about the health data um, because the health data matters. We've, we've said all along that we were gonna look at health data and we we're gonna let that data help drive our decisions. We also need to look at our operations um, to determine whether or not operationally we are ready to return. And there are a number of checklists that go into that operational approach that are extremely important to us to make sure are in place. We also wanna talk about um, the instructional program. Our instructional program is something that we're all very proud of. Um, some of you may have seen uh, the news that came out in the morning announcements and uh, just the other day around uh, SAT scores and uh, Falls Church City Public Schools is the number one school division in the Commonwealth of Virginia around SAT scores. Um, and we are proud of what we do. Um, and so our instructional component is very important as well. And as we work through those, uh, three sort of very discrete sets of um, metrics and measures, we would like to then share with you our graduated um, approach to return for a very small cohort of students. Um, as we begin to build on that smaller cohort, we'll be back to you with further information. But tonight's presentation really is meant to give you a broad lens of what we're looking at with respect to health data, operations, instruction, and then what it might look like for the graduated reopening, specifically with respect to those uh, small, that small cohort, and then what is the timeline for that? All right, Kristen. Um, so as we've approached every stage of um, reopening, there are a number of themes that I think uh, you have heard, and I just wanna reiterate uh, more than anything uh, for our community and for our staff, and that is that we've been emphasizing throughout this process that conditions, not time, were gonna drive our decisions whether or not we were going to reopen our schools. <laughs> um, we also know that things are changing on a, on a weekly, um, monthly basis. And, and because they're subject to change, we need to be consistently looking at the data. And so um, we are, we are continually collaborating as you'll see in that last bullet with the Fairfax County Health Department, with the Virginia Department of Education, with the Virginia Department of Health and our surrounding jurisdictions. And that's not to suggest that we do what our other surrounding jurisdictions do because we, we haven't. Um, we have been very nuanced in our approach, um, but, uh, but we do have to coordinate some because the data from those areas are important to us because we don't, and you'll see later in a slide, work on an island. Um, we also pay very close attention to safety um, we believe very strongly um, that our students and our staff need to be safe when they come back to school or as safe as they can be, uh, given the information that we have. Um, we've listened to feedback from our stakeholders. We've had a number of opportunities to, to hear. Um, and, and one of the nice things that we know about the City of Falls Church is it's not filled with shrinking violets. Uh, we have a lot of people who are very willing to um, share their concerns and, um, and we've been listening to those. Um, and we also have to pay attention to the stability and support for our workforce. And so those are some of the conditions that we are, have really been looking at as we consider um, multiple stages of reopening. So um, one of the things, uh, one other thing that I, I wanna share with respect to reopening is that um, unfortunately at this point in time, um, there are no clear metrics of when to reopen schools safely. <laughs> Um, and, and you can go out and look at a variety of different sources. Um, and you may see some people who will say, this is the time to open. This is the time to not open. You might see another source that says, this is the time to open. They may be in conflict with each other. Um, but truthfully, there are very few um, organizations, if any, that will actually tell you when the right time is it is to reopen schools. However, everyone seems to uh, have a sense of how to open schools safely. Um, and, and as a consequence of that, within the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, school divisions have really been left to make those decisions um, based solely on their local jurisdiction's authority. So um, as the superintendent um, at working uh, in coordination with um, the school board, 
Um, it really is left to us as to when we reopen um, and how we reopen, there's a lot of guidance on. So we have done um, as a school system, an extensive amount of research and developed some pretty significant guidelines around reopening that we wanna share with you tonight. And these are on those three key areas that I mentioned earlier. One is around the established health data metrics. The second is around the division and school level operations, procedures and resources. And then the last is the division and school level instructional plan and resources. So where do um, some of these metrics on, um, on how to open come from? Um, so, and this is who we've been paying attention to. The Center for Disease Controls currently doesn't have, or Disease Center doesn't have any metrics for schools about when to reopen. Um, they do have guidelines on how to reopen that have been very helpful in giving us some guidance as we move forward with our planning, um, but no indication of when the right time is and certainly no measures. The Fairfax County Health Department additionally has not provided us with any measures of when to reopen, only guidance on how to reopen when the time is right. The World Health Organization um, tests positivity rates and they say below 10% is a safe time for businesses in the economy to reopen and less than 5% um, of, of infection would be a good time for considering reopening. And so you'll see some of those data in our presentation tonight, um, but that's about as close as you can get to uh, for any clear metrics of when to open. Um, and then lastly, the Virginia Department of Health has um, done, I think, a really nice job of putting a composite index together. However, um, the guidelines that are in the composite index that speak to burden of disease, trend of, trend of disease, and then spits out a composite are really interesting because the dashboard that they provide for us by our region speaks to guidelines on how to open for businesses and restaurants and the like, and actually don't speak to uh, when to open schools. So if you were to look at and cross-reference, for example, the Virginia Department of Health with the World Health Organization, you'll note in the WHO, the threshold for opening for schools is lower than it is for businesses in the economy. Yet in the Virginia Department of Health, when they, when they put the composite together, they don't take into account gradations of uh, burden or trend in composite scores with respect to school. So here are those eight components that I've shared with you previously about um, the Virginia Department composite score. And I, I just wanna share them quickly again, and then I'm gonna turn it over to um, Rebecca Sharp. And, and tonight you're gonna hear from Rebecca, you're gonna hear from Kristen Michael, and you're gonna hear from William Bates um, about each of their respective areas. But as I turn it over, um, I, I'm happy to answer any questions before I turn it over to, oh, sorry? Somebody. Go okay. ahead, Dr. Noonan, you're fine. Oh, okay. Um, so so the, the eight components to the co composite score are here in front of you. The first is the case incident rate. And what they're looking at is the new COVID cases per 100,000. Um, and they, they mark them as either high, moderate, or low. And the threshold is 10 cases per 100,000 is high, five cases per 100,000 is moderate. And that one component of the dashboard composite represents 50% of the composite weighting. So case incident rate is the highest portion of the composite. And then the next, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, pieces of the composite all are of equal weight. So the next composite component is the percentage positivity on PCR tests. Uh, and that is among COVID uh, PCR tests that are positive and they only have a high or a low threshold. So if it's 10% um, positive, it's high. If it's less than 10% positive, it's low. Um, and then there's COVID outbreak per 100,000. Again, there's a high, moderate, and low. Um, and uh, a 0.06 outbreak per 100,000 in the threshold is considered high. And a 0.04 um, is moderate and the threshold um, between, or I'm sorry, a 0.04 is low and then the threshold between them is moderate. The next is the percentage of case, uh, COVID cases among healthcare workers. So why is that important? That's important because if we have a, high rate of cases among our healthcare workers, then we don't have people to take care of us if we were to get sick. And here they only have a high and a low threat. And if it's 5% um, 
or higher, it's considered high. And if it's lower than 5%, it's a considered low. Then there's rate of emergency visits to, for corona-like illness per 100,000. And again, there are three categories there, high, moderate, and low, high, moderate. Um, and there are six to, visits per 100,000 um, is, is considered low, high, moderate. And then four visits is considered moderate. And then the next is hospitalizations in the ICU. Um, and you can, you can read what the metrics are there. Percentage of hospital beds uh, information is there as well. And then access to PPE um, and whether or not hospitals are able to gain access to PPE. So all of that each week goes into the Virginia Department of Health composite. And then they give us a, a score of, of whether we are high burden, um, moderate burden, low burden, high trend, moderate trend, low trend. Uh, and, and that's how we're looking at the composite. So I wanted to share that with you with a little bit more detail from the last time, because this VDH dashboard will play into um, some of the metrics that we are looking at when we consider coming back to school. So one of the ways that I've tried to think about it is that there are kind of, kind of like I've described, I think the process of building the high school is that there are like a ski hill, you have to go through a number of gates to get to where you wanna go. And I think this is the first gate and there are certain elements in the composite that we have to be at before we begin to consider other components. So with that, um, Chair Anderson, I'm, I'm gonna stop um, but, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca Sharp to actually go through the data. But if there are any questions about anything I've said so far, I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, it, might be, it might be easier just to move ahead, but I'll, I'll leave it to you all. Thanks, Dr. Nuno. I, I will take just a moment to ask um, the members if there are any questions to this point. Um, and uh, as I said, I'm just going to go alphabetical to keep it kind of uh, organized. And so that would mean that I'm going to go to Ms. Downs. Um, and uh, Ms. Downs, I don't know uh, if you have any questions at this point. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Just a quick question. Uh, Dr. Noonan, I believe you've told us that this dashboard is not even though we understand how the rating come is developed, the actual um, score is not available to the public. Is that correct? That is correct, Ms. Downs. Um, we have, uh, we've been working closely with the Fairfax County Health Department. Um, they receive the data from the Virginia Department of Health, and then they um, help us understand that the process has been VDH to um, Fairfax County Health Department and then Fairfax County Health Department when we meet with them once a week um, uh, the interpretation that we understand is that the VDH sends it to, to Fairfax County Health Department to help the schools then understand whether they're low moderate or high but don't actually give us the data behind each of these eight composite scores we, we can um, through multiple websites, find a number of them, but not all of them. And to be perfectly frank with the board, that has been a source of a bit of frustration for us because we would like to know what um, the numbers look like so that we could put up a dashboard, for example, on our website so people can see kind of where we are. Um, but we, we are looking at some other elements of, of this as well, uh, in addition to the VDH dashboard that will help drive our, our thinking. But you're, you're correct. We do not have access to the back end of the composite, so to right. speak. And that, and that is frustrating because, as you said, we've been, you know, there's been guidance on how to open schools, but not when. And so, and we also don't have all the information driving the, to make those decisions um, because it's not being made available to us. So yeah. that is frustrating. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you for recognizing some of our frustration. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Uh, Ms. Litton, uh, I don't know if you have any questions at this point. Um, I do have one quick question, just kind of understanding all the metrics and their importance. I mean, it looks like the Virginia, the VDH dashboard holds cases per 100,000. Definitely, they give that the most weight versus the WHO gave kind of put everything in the percentage positive is that correct and the vdh holds that is, that like part of a bigger you know a much smaller percent 
um, I'm assuming we're going more by VDH or how are we sort of sorting that out? Which of those two we would hold as more important? I, I think that's a really great question. Um, and we're gonna get to some of that information as we go through the metrics in the next several slides, because you'll be able to see kind of what our, L, our five elements of, of data are. Um, but, uh, but again, I think this is one aspect of what we're looking at, but there are others. And part of it is percentage positive rates, particularly in the Fairfax County Health District that we are looking at in terms of decline over periods of time. Great, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Um, I'm gonna go next to Mr. Reidinger and then next to Ms. Russell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, two quick questions, Dr. Noonan. I'm not sure I understand the third element, COVID outbreaks per 100,000. How are outbreaks different from case incidents, which is the first one? Thanks. I'm going to actually ask uh, Ms. Sharp if she wouldn't mind um, talking that through. She's been um, working through these metrics with the BDH or with Fairfax County Health Department. Sure. That one is defined when they see um, when the epidemiologists look at the data for a region and they see a, a hot spot. Typically, you'll see it in places um, where there are, uh, there's a big spike in the, the percent positivity, you'll see a big spike in cases, and it, and it tends to be isolated to a specific area of the region, or it may be um, related to a specific facility. Like an example would be, you know, sometimes you'll see outbreaks identified in a region based on um, if there is a nursing home that might be experiencing a spike. Another example is there are regions of the state where there are correctional facilities who might be experiencing an outbreak. So it really, they define the outbreak as when it's an intensive spike in a very isolated location within the region. Which leads into the second question. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. Um, is the composite only given on a statewide level or on a regional or county level as well? It's actually okay. given on a regional level. Uh, and, and later in the presentation, we'll share who's in that, that region, but it is the Northern region, just so you know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reidinger. Uh, Ms. Russell, I don't know if you have any questions at this point. Um, yeah, thanks, Chair Anderson. I just had two questions and one of them I'm guessing might be answered with Ms. Sharp, but I'll just go ahead and put it out there anyway. Um, and so they have the various metrics for what you need to meet, I guess, in terms of thresholds for the various factors. Um, and I'm just curious if there's also any metrics for how long you need to sustain these particular metrics before you can actually move forward. Because obviously I'm guessing you couldn't just meet it one day and think we're done. Um, so I don't know, Ms. Sharp, if that's something that you're gonna be covering going forward. Yes, part of the metric um, that the VDH shares with us involves trend. And then when you look at these pieces of data, we don't look at one day of data. We look, we look at seven day rolling averages. That's what, get, that's what gets shared with us each week. And then the, for trend, we look at 14 day rolling averages so that you wanna see in order for trend to move, you wanna see it, um, it regions hitting that 14 days of decline in, in these areas. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the second question is, my understanding is that there's a number, I guess probably at this point, maybe in the majority, of colleges and universities across the country have created their own dashboards that they have on their websites. And I'm just curious if we've looked at those for a potential model um, or, you know, I guess if our, we're gonna have a similar one or how those are gonna be different. We, we have, uh, we've begun to not only look at those, but we have a working draft of what uh, our dashboard would look like that we're still trying to refine. So we're, we're trying to get something that we can put up so that people can follow along at home. Okay, great, thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Ms. Russell. I'll go next to Mr. Webb and then to Ms. Snyder. I currently do not have any questions at this moment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Uh, Ms. Snyder. 
Um, so I know one thing that a lot of students are concerned about right now is the uncertainty around the timeline. And I know Dr. Noonan said that we're trying to stay away from specific dates. But once these thresholds are met, will the community be made aware that the thresholds have been met? Or will the school district kind of continue to plan out the reopening beyond that point? I'm not sure if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I uh, thank you, um, Ms. Snyder. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, the reason that we want to get the dashboard up uh, in, in some form or fashion so that others can see kind of where we are is that um, people understand that when we hit these thresholds, there are some, um, there is then sort of kicks in a timeline for planning. Um, we've met a number of these metrics already that we're gonna share later in the presentation, which in some ways sort of has driven us to the point where um, we're starting to think about sort of small cohorts coming back. Um, and because of where we are with respect to the numbers, um, we'll begin conversations with staff about what it might look like to bring um, more students back than these smaller cohorts later on as we move through the, the fall and into the winter. But we would, we would work with the staff and work with the community around um, where, where we are for sure. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Um, and at this point, I, I'll hold my questions till later and say um, thank you uh, and go ahead and we'll move forward to the next chunk. All right, thanks. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ms. Rebecca Sharp, our uh, Empress of COVID. Today, uh, she, tonight, she's gonna share a little bit more about the VDH, some other aspects of um, the metrics. And then at that point, we'll answer some more questions and then uh, Kristen will go after that. Ms. Sharp. Okay, this slide goes over the actual metrics that are and how burden, trend, and the overall composite rating are provided to us from the Fairfax County Health Department. This composite number represents the data for our region. Our region is made up of the health districts for Fairfax County, Fairfax City, Arlington, Alexandria, Loudon, Prince William, Manassas Park, Manassas City, and Falls Church City. So all of those areas go into the VDH composite data for the Northern region. And if you look under burden, that is the burden of disease on the region. And you see those categories there and it ranges from no burden, which is a score of zero, to a low rate of burden, which is runs from zero, um, to eight, and then you see that moderate rate of burden, which is that eight to 16 range. And then you see that high rate of burden, which moves from 16 um, up to the top of the threshold at 24. And each of those eight metrics that Dr. Noonan went over, it, the, with the first metric being um, the number of cases, per 100,000, that makes up 50% of that score. The rest of the other seven metrics are equally weighted. And so that those metrics go into burden and our current burden for our region, which includes all of those areas is 6.1. So we're in the low rate of burden. Last week at this time, for example, we were at a seven. And so you, so we are seeing a seven day decline. Now, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were in the moderate range, but we've had a good couple of weeks with um, social mitigation. And you can see, um, and, and folks really follow in those, those procedures. So you see an impact in the data. The next piece of data that gets shared as part of the composite is the trend score. And that really goes at that question for how long do you, do, are you looking for this? And that again, is that they're looking to see in each of those, those pieces of data, what is the trend? There are three categories, decreasing, steady or fluctuating and increasing. And right now we are in that steady or fluctuating category. And so that set kind of that seven to 15 range is where you see the numbers are kind of going up and down and you're not seeing. So over that 14 day trend, you're seeing significant up and down um, 
movement of those numbers. And when you're looking at increasing, you're seeing, okay, we're seeing stability and increasing over that seven to 14 day threshold. Same thing for decreasing. In order for us to be able to move into the decreasing category for trend, we would wanna see the, the VDH wants to see those numbers consistently going down on each of those indicators. And both of those numbers go, um, go to create the category of that increasing, decreasing, steady, the no burden from low to high. Those burden, those piece, those two pieces for trend and burden go together to look at the, an overall transmission rating for the region. There's no number score that's given to that. It's a, it's a very sophisticated um, epidemiological mixture of if you're in a high rate of burden, but you have decreasing trend, or if you have increasing trend, but you're in a low rate of burden, it puts you in the different categories. And those are determined by the Virginia Department of Health. And the overall category composites um, that we see are a minimal burden on a community, a low rate of burden. They've um, Last week, they added two additional categories under this composite. The first one being approaching moderate to a moderate rate of burden to then approaching substantial to a substantial rate of burden of transmission on a community. And right now, because we are in a low rate of burden and we have a steady or fluctuating trend across all the measures, that puts us in an overall composite of low. And there's my version of epidemiology 101 for everyone. So, <laughs> all right, the next thing that we did was we looked at, so that VDH shared with us what those pieces of data um, were that they're using. And again, as Dr. Noonan shared, those eight pieces of data, if you look at them, they're pieces that aren't specifically related to schools. They're related to how, access to PPE by hospitals, the um, rate of COVID-like um, visits to an ER. What, and they're really, those, me those metrics and those measures and that composite are designed to help provide regional guidance regarding reopening of the, of the economy. And so what we then went looking for were additional resources and data points that could point us to where, where do we see information specific to schools? Because we, you know, we were seeing the how to reopen, but not the when to reopen. So some of the other additional resources that we utilized were the Harvard Global um, Health Institute developed um, key metrics for suppression that are specifically related to schools. COVID Act Now is a, is a, resource, a resource that we also use. They look at <clears throat> that data um, that comes from COVID Act Now also helps to fuel Johns Hopkins um, data that they use in their coronavirus resource, resource center. We also utilized um, COVID Local, which is um, provides an actual frontline guide for local decision makers. And that did provide some more specific data and guidelines around which health metrics are the best to use for local decision makers, particularly school, school divisions and reopening schools. And they all lean towards four pieces of data, particularly the COVID Act Now pieces, looking at you want to see decreasing percent positivity rates for those being tested, and you want to see that 14-day decline. Again, decreasing the um, numbers of new cases per 1,000 in your area with a 14-day decline. Decreasing rates of infection is with a 14-day decline was also a piece that was picked up by in, in this research. And then that final measure that you see there's contact tracing. And that measure looks at the efficiency of a region in, um, tra in, in tracking and conducting a contact tracing investigation within 24 hours, that it started within 24 hours. And so those are four pieces of data that when we did additional research beyond just the Virginia Department of Health, the CDC, Fairfax County Health Department, and beyond the World Health Organization. These were the other pieces of data. And so those, those first two, you see commonality across, you know, those are pieces that VDH are using and, and they're also pieces that these uh, um, other um, researchers have also indicated are critical for local areas to use. 
you want to go to the next slide, Kristen? So this kind of brings us to the next piece of what are the key concepts that are going to help us guide our decisions um, regarding some of the reopening process and the decisions that we have to make. One is that we're going to look at health data metrics across four health districts, given that that's where the majority of our staff come from. And so we're going to use Fairfax County health data Arlington data, Alexandria data, and Loudoun data. And that's really critical because so, ma so many of our staff come from um, those areas. And if you see the, um, in fact, if you see the map, you can see that we're, we're not an island. We are, we are you know, even though rates within our city limits are lower, we are significantly impacted by the areas directly surrounding us and the impact that that has on our health and as well the impact that it has on our staffing ability. The next thing that we also discovered in this research, and it's it's an important you know understanding, and I know folks kind of hate that term "new normal" because I think we hear it a lot, but it really is critical for that as a part of understanding our current situation in terms of the health um, crisis that we're facing and that we have some common agreements and understanding and that one of those critical pieces and Dr. Gloria um, who leads the Fairfax County Health Department often shares this that all stakeholders have to understand that until there's a vaccine or treatment there is no 100% risk-free environment and so that's a concept that that is going to be is hard, you know, for us to grasp as we move through addressing these issues in a pandemic. And then there are going to be COVID-19 positive cases in our community. That's a that's a part of our new normal and, and something that that we have to, you know, be prepared for. There's safe and safer standards, but risk is always going to exist. And mitigation strategies are critical and substantially reduce the risk. So when we can get our health data low in, in a good place, then we pair that with mitigation, then you see risk going substantially down. So that's what we're striving for. The last piece is as we move through sharing this data with, um, with the board and with the community is that you don't see green on these charts and you're not going to see green because there's no green as a part of this data analysis. We have a new normal. We have times where there are medium risk, where we're seeing declined and suppressed disease transmission, lower burdens of disease on communities, or we have situations where we're in high risk, um, where we see significant ongoing spread and moderate disease burden across our community. And then you'll see purple, which is a, considered a critical or a lockdown. And these are those common kind of common understandings that came out of that research. And then the third concept is we are proposing that we will use five pieces of data to give us a comprehensive view of the health metrics for our area. We're gonna use that weekly VDH dashboard that we get updates on from um, the Fairfax Health Department. So we will be constantly monitoring our, our burden of disease on our, our region, our trend for our region and the overall composite that we've shared. We will also be monitoring the percent positivity of positivity of tests with the, and looking for a 14 day decline for those four areas, those four regions that impact us. So we're gonna look at an average across those regions. We're also gonna look at the number of new cases per 100,000 with a 14 day decline. We also are gonna monitor the infection rate with a 14 day decline that we're looking for there, and then contact tracing. That data currently is only available at the state level, but when we get to that data slide, we have data for our specific school division on that in our working that we do. So that data is monitored, but it's not really going to be included in our decision-making. For this one, we then translated into, if we're looking at all these measures and we have these categories of low, moderate, high, critical, what would be our response as a school system in each one of those categories? And you can see that when it's critical, you know, and we were at a critical point with our data, which, you know, that's where we were as, you know, uh, you know, 
as you know, we moved through, you know, March and, and particularly in April, and we were significantly higher in June. Um, things have, have gone steadily gotten better, but in that critical phase, you'll see that it's 100% virtual instruction with buildings closed for staff. Then you have that high risk um, area of time, which is that 100% virtual instruction with buildings um, open for staff. And that's where that's, you know, where we are right now. Our students are in 100% virtual instruction. Our buildings are open if our teachers wish to teach from the buildings. That next phase is moving into moderate. And so that's where you'll see, you know, us being able to dial into a hybrid reopening for our special um, population in those smaller cohorts that Dr. Noonan talked about using that phased approach and eventually moving into that hybrid reopening for the entire division again in a phased approach and moving us into a low risk environment, which would be hopefully achieving some kind of new normal so that we can get to, you know, operations uh, uh, more more a um, more semblance of normal for our students and staff and looking at face-to-face -face, um reopening the thing to know about these pieces of data is it's not a light switch where you know one day we're going to hit it and a switch is going to flip on and we're going to you know say okay it, you know that we can move this is when you're dealing with these types of health conditions in a pandemic it's really more of a dial it's dialing up your your mitigation efforts or dialing them back based on how your data looks and so that's why you'll see those two error arrows that indicate when our health conditions worsen, we dial back our reopening plans. When our health conditions improve, we are able to dial those up. Um, another note that uh, regarding that I think some one of the common questions folks have when we talk about this continuum of reopening stages is that any classroom or school closure will be based on the level ex of exposure in a building and guidance from the Fairfax County Health Department in collaboration with our school division leadership. This is a fluid process and we part of our new normal in in addressing reopening schools in a pandemic that we've learned through the research and what we've seen in places that have been successful with their reopening and also lessons learned from school divisions who have not been successful and have had to close is that you know closings quarantines and isolations are a part of reopening and a part of life in a in a pandemic. So we are gonna to have to understand that whole dialing up and dialing back. And so being flexible, um, the flexibility for all stakeholders is really important, you know, in our collective efforts to be safe and move through this reopening process. And our last big um, concept that we gathered from the data is that when mitigation practices go up, risks go down. The behaviors that we have today really do influence how we can provide educational services tomorrow. And, you know, it, and Dr. Noon, I think over the, you know, we're all, everywhere you go, you see, do you have, you know, mask up? And, you know, it's those practices of washing our hands using social distancing, wearing masks, that when we do those in conjunction, you know, with lower health data, we know that risks go significantly down. And so that's really important that we understand that when we have strong mitigation practices in place, risks will go down. We can't ever eliminate the risk 100%, but when we put good mitigation and strong mitigation in place, then our risks do go down. So what are the specific health metric standards for dialing up and dialing down along the continuum that we're going to be looking at for our school division? The first piece of data is really looking at that percent positivity. That data is, pro, um, is provided to us. It's available on VD, VDH's website. It's also, there's a Northern Virginia regional um, website. We also use, utilize Johns Hopkins. As Dr. Noonan shared, one of the struggles that we've had in going through this process is there is no one place where all of this data is available for all of the areas that we need to look at. So it does take a little bit to go through and find all those pieces. And so right now that this piece of data that we look at is the percent positivity rate. Right? That's a percent of positives um, results out of all tests that are done on that seven day rolling average. And so right now what we are experiencing across our four health districts that we're utilizing, um, we see that 7.4. So if you think about that, you know, that getting to that 
moderate risk, that lower end of the risk, meeting that World Health Organization threshold, meeting the, you know, the um, other thresholds that have been established. You, you want to see your, particularly for schools divisions, you would want to see your percent positivity be 5% or lower. And right now we're sitting at 7.4% across the four regions and you can see them broken out. And I've also included, you know, Prince William County, DC and Maryland, because we are impacted by, by those. And are we seeing a 14 day, 14 day decline in this particular piece of data? And the answer to that right now is no. And the next piece of data that we look at, that we're going to look at are the percent of new cases per 100,000. That again is based on that seven day rolling average and we are sitting um, in the in the orange or me, kind of medium risk area for our um, area, and we're sitting in a 9.1. So that means there's an average of 9.1 new cases of COVID positive per 100,000 in the population. And so you'd want you want that to be under, you know, under 10. And we are not seeing a 14 day decline in that piece of data either. And the next piece of data that we look at is the infection rate among your total population. And that piece of data um, puts us at a 0.96. And you're looking for a one, you're really look, you're looking for to stay in under that, you know, 1.1 range. And what that is the um, rate of infection looks at, it's it looks at that if one the if I'm COVID positive, how likely, how many other people am I likely to infect based on the the rates of positive that we're seeing in the community? And so you want you know that there that should stay under one is that one point one range. And so that piece of data um, for us is that 0.96 range. That piece of data is the one piece of data where there is um, a decline seen in the overall rate of infection for our area. And so the other, the next piece of data that we'll include in our analysis is really analyzing that VDH data dashboard for burden trend um, and that regional composite. That's a that's an important piece for for us to look at because that that does look at our bigger region it includes a lot of areas that may not, may not impact us directly but are a part of the overall region that that data is reported at so you can see we are low for composite and the overall composite because we are low and in burden and because we are um, steady or fluctuating in trend and actually we're fluctuating down in trend right now And then the last piece of data that I alluded to earlier is the percent of contact tracing. This is really important. And this piece of data looks at the percent of contact tracing that's acted upon within 24 to 48 hours over a seven day rolling average. This data is only provided at a state level. So you'll only see Virginia, DC and Maryland on there. And you can see where we are as a state. However, I wanted um, to point out to the board and to the community that we have a very, very responsive health department. Our contact tracing rate for Falls Church City Public Schools is 100%. One, within 24 hours of every case that we have received positive notification on in our school division, we have received support from the health department within 24 hours, which I think is amazing. So I wanted to point that out. So for that particular piece of data, we as a locality really are in that, you know, that highest um, category that we would want to be in. So that, I believe that's our last data slide. I know that's a lot of information to process in a really short amount of time. I think there's one more. Uh, one more? Ms. Sharp. Yep, oh, there I'm we sorry. go. I apologize. And this is really where we pulled all of the pieces together and in get, trying to give us an overall picture of where do we stand in terms of our data for our area. And our area is defined as those four health, um, those four, um, those four health areas, regions that we talked about, not the entire big region, but our area that we're focusing on that impacts us closely. 
And so when you, so you can see across, this is just a summary of do we meet the standard in each of those, those areas and do we meet the 14 day decline threshold for each of those pieces of data? So you can see so, our yeses and our noes. Yeah, so, so Mr. Anderson, um, those are the pieces of data that we have been looking at. There was a lot of information that was sort of shared with you. Um, some of it is intersectional, just in terms of um, some overlap. Um, but just to reiterate a little bit of what um, Ms. Sharp said, you know, we really want to begin with looking at that VDH composite um, and making sure that we are in good shape there. And then we're going to look at those uh, other measures that are more specific to just the four localities where most of our folks come from that work in the City of Falls Church. We are seeing good movement. Um, we are seeing some trends in the right direction. Um, in the most recent data set that we saw um, just two days ago or yesterday uh, indicates that there is some, some good movement in the right direction. Um, but right now, for us to bring back all of the students into a hybrid solution wouldn't make sense from um, our perspective with respect to specifically these health data metrics. That doesn't mean that we can't bring back some of our students, but bringing back everyone all at the same time, um, it just doesn't make sense with respect to the measures and metrics. Um, so those are, those are the health, that's the health portion. The next portion is the operational and then instructional after that. So we can pause there if you'd like. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ms. Sharp and Dr. Noon. And I think it'd be good to take a pause and, and make sure folks can get some questions answered here. Um, so I'll start in reverse order this time, just to keep things moving. And uh, I'll come to Mr. Webb and then uh, Ms. Russell and then Mr. Ryder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so thank you. This is a lot of information to kind of take in. Um, one of my couple of questions I've been formulating with looking at this um, so we are consistently using this as our kind of threshold for the bigger picture of, of the full hybrid. Um, where are we with, I, I think I've heard someone before with uh, having to have a health nurse or someone in the building. Where are we with that particular piece of it as we look towards more of those smaller populations that we're thinking mm -hmm. about possibly bringing back? And I don't know if it's a... Ms. Yeah, Sharp yeah. or Dr. Noonan question. I, I'd be happy to take that. Um, it's a really good question. Um, and so the, as, as I think everybody here knows, the Fairfax County Health Department, when our schools closed in the spring, um, pulled back their public health nurses from our buildings uh, so that they could re redeploy those health nurses across the county to help with contact tracing, to help with intake, interviewing, um, to help with a variety of different tasks. Uh, we have been working with the health department and they have told us at this point, if we give them one month um, of advance notice that we uh, will bring, they would send back our public health nurse. So we have already initiated the recall um, message to the county health department. Um, and that was as of the end of last week. Um, so it looks like we will have our public health nurse back likely um, the 1st of October. That is one of the operational metrics certainly um, that you've, you've hit on, Mr. Webb, that's really important because as you may recall, uh, in the past when Ms. Sharp has done her presentations on special education, uh, a significant number of our students, particularly those students that are in our lower incidence population, many of them have health plans. And so it's imperative that we have a, health, a public health nurse um, at our school sites um, that's available for us to bring back our, our lower incidence special ed students. Um, so because we've initiated that recall, um, that sort of previews for you what's coming a little later in the presentation, um, but uh, certainly that health healthcare provider is very important to us. Thank you, and that's actually very good news for me to hear um, that that part, that piece has already started to uh, the ask for the recall that's already started to happen. Um, with all this information, I, I do really, it's a pretty big, uh, you know, task to overall do. And I am fully recognizing that we have a fairly decent number of our teachers who do come from some of the other extended regions of our health area. So uh, I do appreciate the information to, uh, 
what we're looking at matrix metrics wise because I think it does help the community get a better feel for the the big task of trying to get back to some form of hybrid um, in person classes. So that was the main question I had for me about that that piece of the metric because I knew we had talked about that before of the the health nurse being back in the building being an important component of that. So that's it for me right now, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, and I'll go to uh, Ms. Russell and then Mr. Reininger and then Ms. Litton. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, mine is less of a question and just more, I guess, of a comment or a thank you. And I know pretty much every meeting I effuse over Ms. Sharp's work in this area and how much she's done and how much we appreciate her. Um, but I just want to extend that to both Dr. Noon and Ms. Sharp and the whole team. Um, what you've outlined this evening obviously is something that was never part of your professional training at any point in your career. Um, and you probably never hoped it would be. Um, otherwise you might've gone into epidemiology or public health. Um, so I just wanna extend my sincere appreciation for the monumental task of getting yourselves up to speed and understanding this very complex data, um, you know, getting your arms around it and be able to analyze it because obviously you have a school district to run. And so adding this on top of it, I'm sure was no easy task. And so thank you um, for really digging in and getting your arms around this because I think we're all gonna benefit as a result. Thank you, we have a great team. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Um, and I agree 100% with everything you said. Uh, I'll go next to Mr. Reidinger and then Ms. Litton and then um, Dr. Dimmick. Uh Thank you, Chair Anderson. Could I delay and go a little bit later in the group? I'm just looking at some data pieces right now and I'm not ready to go yet. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Litton. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I actually have a question for Ms. Sharp, and it's mostly because you've become an expert probably on these metrics, and it's something I haven't really understood the whole time I've seen this metric. Um, on the percent positivity rate, I mean, that's percent of people tested, right? So it seems like it'd be pretty dependent on how available testing is in your area kind of what that rate would be. I mean, is that your understanding or am I just misunderstanding it? No, that's a that that is that's spot on actually. That's why you hear so much about we have to increase our rate of tests, the number of people who we are testing so that we get a better picture of actually what a positivity rate looks like in a community. So the more people that you test, the more accurate that data is. For, a, for an area. And that's a national issue. Yeah, yeah, just because it, it seems like over COVID, it's been kind of all over the place. You see some places where they've got testing on the corner, whoever wants to go by. And other people have said, oh, I've called my doctor's office and they said, if I don't have significant system, I mean, symptoms don't come in. So, so to me, I always see that metric and think like, uh, you know, how reliable is that? So I know, I know it's widely used. So I just wanted to make sure I was understanding it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Um, so next I would go to Dr. Dimmick and then Ms. Downs and then Ms. Snyder. Thanks, sorry for joining you all late and for missing the presentation. Um, I am impressed by all the work that the staff has done on this. I don't have any questions on this for now. Um, I, I guess I do wanna say that I feel like from family in other states, the school district does not have to do this heavy lift. The state has done it for them and lets them know when they can go back to school, at least for family of mine that teach in another state. So I really do appreciate all the work you've done on this to try and sort of figure out what what will work best for us and what will be safe for everyone involved. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, Ms. Downs. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. Uh, terrific presentation. Thank you for all of your work. And also, of course, Dr. Noonan, thank you for 
all you've done. Um, two quick questions. Uh, one is um, looking at this data metric checklist that's um, I think on the screen right now. Um, so if I'm understanding, even when we have, we're meeting the standard, it doesn't matter unless we have the 14 day decline. Is that correct? That's, yes, that's part of what you want to, it's not that it doesn't matter. It's that you, you're also looking for stability in your, in your data. You know, it goes back to, I think someone asked that question earlier, you know, it, it, I think it was you look at asking the, you know, is it oh, yeah. from day to day? And so that's where, that's where you address that, those day to day bumps. So you want to see that 14 day trend to okay. really see that in your community, that that particular data is moving one way or another. Right. So, you know, it's sort of a reliable statistic. It gives you stability in that piece of data. Okay. Um, the other question I had was um, for your concept number four, I love the continuum. Um, would it, would you see it happening um, that, you know, there is, um, for lack of a better word, an outbreak at, at Mason. So we would have to go back to virtual for Mason, but then our other schools, if there were no incidents, we would still stick with a hybrid. Do, do we see that happening that there, we'd be going school to school depending on if there's an infection outbreak? That's a, that's a, oh, go ahead, Ms. Sharp, if you want to answer that. I can just, address, I can address it in terms of how our response to a COVID positive and mm -hmm. that when we have a COVID uh, positive in our community, that contact tracing happens. And then we receive um, information from the health department, whether that COVID positive case involved exposure or no exposure. And so when you have exposure, then the next thing that you look for is that level of exposure. So if it's just involving one or two students, it might just be, you know, in a teacher, it might just be quarantining that class. It might just be the kids that and the staff that were in that, you know, in that small area. It could be if, you know, a large, if there are larger numbers and the exposure is greater, it could mean the entire classroom. And it, you know, it could mean multiple classrooms, but that's why we work so closely with the health department. And I'm really grateful to them because they have been on 100% of our cases. And even the ones where it's, it was, you know, cause as we were rolling, you know, into this, this was all new to everybody. And, you know, and it is concerning, you know, when someone feels ill and they go home with the COVID, you know, with some, with those COVID symptoms. Now we know that's called a COVID like illness and they're there's a response for that versus a COVID positive with exposure, COVID positive without exposure. So all of those are going to, those decisions are going to be driven by our level of exposure and our guidance from the health department and, you know, and then leadership decisions. So I think the rest of that would go to Dr. Newman. No, I, I, I think you've hit it. And I, and I guess the you said it much more articulately than I would have. I think my answer would have been it depends. Um, and I and I think what uh, Ms. Sharp has described is sort of there are multiple variations of, of what can happen. So it's hard to, and I think that that's one of the things that's really hard to communicate to the community. Um, if one teacher or one student has COVID, um, it doesn't mean that everything shuts down, um, that there is a whole contact tracing um, event that happens to determine whether or not someone's truly been exposed. And part of it is also the intensity of your social mitigation. So mm -hmm. you can be in or you can be in an area with someone who is COVID positive. And you know, if we've been to the grocery, if we've been out to dinner, if we really have been anywhere in our community, we probably have been around someone who has tested positive for COVID. Uh, you know, that's just the, the environment in which you know we we exist right now. And so it's about the um, the exposure. So that's why on some of those other presentations, we've shared that it's about the exposure and that's what's going to help us. So if we have a COVID positive, it is about the level of exposure. So if we have good social distancing, good hand washing, folks are wearing, you know, wearing face coverings and, you know, we're staying apart. And if we have to be closer together, then it's for lim very limited periods of time, then we're not going to have exposure. Does that make sense? When I, and it is hard for people to understand that. It, uh, it does. And it's, you know, it, it's one of those things we can't, we have to wait, you know, take it on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. So I understand that. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, Ms. Snyder, I don't know if you have any questions at this point. Yes, I have one question. So as we've been talking about contact tracing, the rate right now for contact tracing for cases within Falls Church City Schools is 100%. But as we bring students back and we bring all of the staff back, or at least everyone who feels comfortable coming back um, when we begin the hybrid model, there will be a lot more people potentially to contact trace. So do we have the resources to continue to maintain that 100% rate? And do we have like the planning in place to continue to do that too? That, that also is an excellent question. Um, we've been working closely. So we don't actually do the contact tracing, the Fair, uh, Fairfax County Health Department does. Uh, and they have continued to assure us that they're hiring at a, a relatively high clip to ensure that they have the appropriate number of contact tracers uh, in case there is a need. Um, but you're, you're very much right. I think when we bring students back and we haven't determined when the right time to bring everyone back um, into a hybrid is until we get to a place where um, our metrics look better. Um, but I, I think we have to rely pretty heavily on um, our partners at the health district and, and what they've been doing um, to hire contact tracers and, and ask those really hard questions of them before we, before we move ahead. Great. Thank question. you, Ms. Snyder. Uh, Mr. Rodinger, are you, do you have questions at this point? Uh, otherwise, we'll come back around to you in just a few. And you're muted. Yes, I do, Chair Anderson. Thank you. Um, uh, and I, I apologize in advance for a couple of things. One, um, I'm not an epidemiologist like all of you, so I'm trying to figure this out, and I apologize if the questions are not well informed. Um, the the second thing is I, I, I was I delayed because I thought I saw a change in numbers and I was trying to figure out why and I realized that it was the it was the trend for VDH that I saw two different numbers, but one was the version that was on board docs and one was the one that was projected and so a number changed in between those two and it took me about five minutes to figure out what that was. Um, so apologies for that. Um, a couple of questions slash comments. Um, one is um, on the on the 14 day decline column, the far right column, um, do we do you and we really mean decline or do you mean decline or steady? Um, because I mean, I can imagine we would be low in a number of categories and while we wouldn't be happy with, you know, we would a red X if it wasn't declining anymore, if we were you know, low in positivity rate and low in new cases, we'd be fine. I, I suggest that probably is about a 14 day decline or a, um, a steadiness depending um, on what the actual status of the, the column is. So that's one thing. Um, the other, because it's a related question, I'll just spit out. I'm not sure why we look at 14 day declines for any of the VDHs or for the infection rate. And um, the reason is, and this is, this is not epidemiology, it's math, right? So it could be completely misapplied. You know, infection rate is actually tells you if things are going down. So as long as you're below one on infection rate, I don't know, you know if it's 0.9 and it stays 0.9 over time, that's great, right? Because we're having an infection rate, the number of cases are going down. So it doesn't really matter whether the derivative of infection rate um, is above or below one. And then for VDH, 14-day um, decline, doesn't the trend column or the trend row at the very bottom catch the, 14, catch the decline part? So the, the Right hand column, the bottom three. I just I worry that we're double counting trends there since we don't necessarily know the formula that goes into VDH trend. I, I, I'm, I'm a little, I just, I guess, I guess I'm confused by that. No, that's a really good question. VDH's trend can change, changes each week. 
And so you can see fluctuations in their numbers. What, and, you know, in fact, they've been reporting these numbers to us for uh, th this Friday will be the fourth, um, the fourth week that we've received these three numbers. And so since we started, like when we started, we were in a, we went from low to moderate, moderate to low. And then trend went from, went from decreasing to increasing to steady that we've been in steady. And so what you want to see with those, with, with those three numbers, what I would want to see for us is that we see stability within those numbers. And so when you see consistent decline, and so that trend is consistently going down over time for those three, for those three pieces of data. That's what that's, so I understand how it appears to be, but it gives you that, because those numbers can change each week, but and we so, want to see them consistently going down. So I, I also think I understand what your question is. And, I, and I, I think one of the things that we might want to do is go back and look at that 14 day decline column, only because it would be 14 day decline or steady with below, and I, probably the wrong words here, but, but with below the, the threshold. Um, so for example, if we're at 4.5% positivity rate, it doesn't matter whether we decline. It would be great if we declined in 14 days, but we wouldn't necessarily need to decline over 14 days because we're still less than 5%. So I, I, think, I think to that point, um, we probably want to look at, we can look at sort of massaging some language or maybe even adding another column that sort of clearly identifies or met threshold or something like that. Um, and then with respect to the infection rate, I, I, I also, I think that's another place where you're, you're either in the range or you're not. And so it makes a lot of sense to say met the threshold or doesn't meet the threshold, kind of a yes or no, um, as opposed to a, a decline. So why don't we why don't we take that back and, and look at it? I think that's good. That's good feedback. Thank you, Mr. Reininger. Um, so I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask, and then we're, we'll go back around and I'll start. Uh, I'll, I'll again go back to Mr. Webb. Um, my question is sort of building off of Ms. Lytton's question about testing. Um, at this point, right, we can get the percent positivity rate, but um, if we can't test enough people to have a good sample of the population, um, that's of limited utility. So my question is now, what are our limiters in getting um, tests sufficiently and sufficiently rapid in sufficient numbers um, to be able to, to use those data? That's a good question. We've been... Um trying, I think, uh, relatively diligently for the last month or more to partner with um, the Fairfax County Health Department around um, some sort of rapid testing um, protocol that would allow us to um, appropriately screen, appropriately test for um, whether or not someone was uh, positive in that moment or not. And unfortunately, um, the current tests that are out that are within the rapid testing realm or the point of, um, point of contact, if you will, are, are not good tests to be used as sort of screeners. Um, the best kinds of screeners are, and, and those rapid tests for the most part are protein tests as opposed to PCR um, sort of uh, uh, molecular tests, if you will. So it's the molecular test that gives you much better information, and those all require a lab to be able to um, turn the, the sample. Um, the sample needs to be stable to get to the, to the lab, and the lab takes time to return the, um, the sample uh, outcome, and that has been taking up to upwards of 10 days in some cases. So right now, um, we are, we're not in a good position to be able to do more testing locally. Um, we are asking our parents that, you know, if, if they want to get tested, to work with a, their healthcare providers um, to get tested, just to kind of, be, because I, I think it's, um, the more tests that you have, my assumption is the, the positivity rate is going to go down because you have a bigger 
universe of people that are being tested. So um, you may get more people that are positive, which is what you want to find out. But in the end, you're going to end up with a, likely a less percentage of the population positive. Um, looking at some of the measures that we're seeing across um, across the, the country. So I guess all that to say um, that we will continue to work with the health department to see if we can find some solution for us to test. Um, I've been working with Wyatt Shields as well. He's also been working with Dr. Gloria, Fairfax County Health Department, to see if we can be um, somehow useful in piloting um, different tests and the like. Um, so I think the, the biggest barrier, Dr. Anderson, is that there really isn't a good screening test right now that's out there that's available. The best one that looks like it's on the horizon um, is from a, 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 gem, a doctor, Dr. Mina from Harvard, who actually is looking at viral load. Um, and when, when your viral load is the highest, you are most likely to be um, shedding and be contagious. And it's not at the, t the front tail of the curve or at the back tail of the curve, but really sort of in the middle of that curve, sort of on the uptrend and on the downside of the curve. Um, and if that gets some traction, what's nice about that is um, the cost is about a dollar a test. Uh, and we can administer those very quickly to see who is actually shedding virus. Um, and that would allow us to send kids home, would allow us to bring kids in, um, but we're obviously not there yet. So that's pr probably um, partially answers your question, but, um, or maybe fully answers your question, but in a much longer way than you had hoped. No, thanks, that's good. Um, I guess I wanna just ask a little bit more um, finer detail, because I'm trying to understand at this point, if the limitation is that the tests that would be accurate enough to give us reliable data are just taking too long because of uh, the complexities of running the lab assays and all of that. Or if it's that the, um, the Fairfax County Health or, or VDH, um, for whatever reason, is not, uh, doesn't think the, the other tests like the Yale test or the Harvard test are uh, sufficiently accurate or reliable that they can get behind it or if it's um, that there just aren't available in large enough numbers. I guess I'm trying to sort of parse that out a little bit, partially to find out if there's any advocacy that we can do to sort of help with that. So my, uh, my understanding from um, hearing from the health department and the Virginia Department of Health is that right now, it's actually harder to get a COVID um, PCR test than it was several weeks ago or even a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, the, the timeline for return of those PCR tests is extending because there has been there has been more testing, but the supply chain specifically to the reagents and to the vials necessary to be able to do those PCR tests are taking a longer time to source. So it's actually um, more of a supply line issue, from my understanding. The conversations with the VDH and with the uh, Fairfax County Health Department that it's the true barrier. Okay. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, I feel like, can we just get back to education, please? <laughs> well, I was going to make an observation, which was to ask when you're, uh, when uh, you guys are gonna get your honorary NPHs, um, maybe not honorary, I don't know, maybe just a few classes at this point. We've got the thesis work already done, sorry. Um, so at this point, I guess I'd like to go ahead and uh, ask questions and let the board uh, members continue to ask questions and uh, go again to Mr. Webb, uh, going again in reverse alphabetical order. So Mr. Webb, I don't know if you have any further questions at this point. No additional questions at this point. Um, but again, like Ms. Russell said, just thank you all very much for picking up a new, uh, new job along the way over the last few months. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, Ms. Russell, I don't know if you have any further questions at this point. No, I'm good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Reitinger. No further questions right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Litton. No, no additional questions, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dimmick. No additional questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ms. Downs. I have one quick additional question. Uh, 
this, uh, you know, when Ms. Sharp and Dr. Nina, when, when the team sent uh, the school board this presentation, I, I just was overwhelmed with the amount of research you all put into this. Um, and, you know, it was definitely an education for me. I just wanted to, um, you know, see if we were planning to um, email this presentation out or put it on morning announcements, um, just how, um, you know, we were going to get this information out to our community because I think this will be really enlightening for them. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we plan to put it on morning announcements tomorrow. Uh, and, and we'll also, um, it'll, it'll be on board docs. And I, I thought I would send it out. I'm, I'm planning to do a message to the community this, um, this week. So perhaps um, this would be a, a useful piece for me to send out on, on Friday to the community as well. I, I think so. Um, no offense to um, Mr. Brett or uh, Carol Sly, but I think sometimes people don't always read morning announcements. I do religiously, but I think to, to hit it as many different ways as we can, whether it's, it might be both morning announcements and uh, via one of your emails, because I, I just think it will help parents understand the sort of um, you know questions that we're facing and the research that still needs to be done. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, Ms. Snyder, I don't know if you have any further questions at this point. No further questions right now. Okay, thank you. And uh, and I don't either. So at this point, I think Dr. Nuno, we're ready to move ahead to the next piece. Great, thank you. I'm going to actually turn it over to Kristen Michael, and she's going to talk about the operational needs uh, that we need to meet in order to reopen our schools. So, Ms. Michael. So thank you so much for the opportunity this evening to present the operational metrics. The data that I'm presenting to you tonight and the information is truly due to all of the great work for the support directors and all of the hard things that they've been working on for months as we've been preparing to open school. Um, so I, I would be completely remiss if I didn't give them credit for all of the work in the slides that follow. So I'm going to present the operational metrics in three buckets. First, I'm going to look at facilities, which is really what is the support for the physical distancing and cleaning that we're doing in each of our facilities. Second, I'm gonna talk about supplies and equipment. That's really to ensure that we're protecting each other. And then lastly, our procedures. And those are for both staff and student health. Okay. So first in terms of facilities, classrooms and other spaces are all being set up to ensure that we have six feet of physical space. Um, between students and between staff. So we went out over the summer. It was a huge team effort. I'm led by many of the staff that you see on this call tonight, as well as others. And we set up test or sample classrooms in every single building. And then we use those classrooms to work with teachers so we could really give people agency in terms of setting up their space in a way that worked while ensuring that six feet of physical distancing. We've also been looking at putting physical barriers in places where we know we have high exposure risks. So when you come into our school buildings, for example, you'll see that we've moved the station where people check in with the security guard. So it's off the desk right in front of the guard, but it's actually on a stand. And really looking at where do we need to put physical barriers in high traffic areas. The next is our ventilation systems. And this is something that really um, has engendered a lot of questions, which are great. So I wanted to take just a minute to talk about our ventilation systems. So when we think of those systems, they're really influenced by how new the HVAC system is in that specific building. So when we look at our three newest buildings in terms of those systems, which isn't the building age, but the system age, it's really Jesse Thackeray Preschool, Mount Daniel and Thomas Jefferson. Our, our, our systems in every one of those schools use economizers and those economizers bring in outside air and they're recirculating that air through the building. And those systems are designed to ensure that we're bringing in air and at the same time we're being efficient. So we're not overusing our heating and cooling. So when we look at the systems on each of those buildings, they're currently averaging about 20% fresh air, which far exceeds that code standard of 10%, but it will fluctuate. And we have a minimum level currently set on all of those of 12%, um, but they currently are averaging about 20%. At Mary Ellen Henderson, that system was installed in 2004 and that system requires it to be manually adjusted and it has eight units that we've done. So all of those have already been manually set to ensure that we're bringing in 20% of outside air. Again, double that code requirement. 
Our oldest building, of course, is George Mason. If you'll believe, George Mason has a hundred different RTUs in that building. So when we were planning on opening in a hybrid before, we actually started the process of manually adjusting all of those systems, right? But once we knew we weren't bringing all the students back in, we kind of stopped because we're trying to ensure that we're bringing in enough fresh air, but we're not um, causing some significantly large heating and air conditioning bills while we have no students in place. So depending on when we open, we will ensure that we've manually adjusted those systems to ensure that we're getting adequate amounts of fresh air because we know ventilation is key. And then as we look at the new high school as well, we've also been working with a the builder there um, in terms of ensuring that we have that fresh air. Now that fresh air is also kind of coupled with the filtration that goes on in our buildings. So currently the filters that we use are MERV 8, right? We replaced all of our filters. We do it about every 90 days. So they were all replaced um, before school opened, which is part of our standard practice each year. So all of those filters are slated to be replaced again before we start November. And when we replace them, what we're currently doing, um, Sevi Padilla is leading this, our facilities director, is looking to increase those to MERV 15 or 16. And that would ensure that we're filtering out 95% of those small particles. So it's just below that HEPA filter level. Um, so we've really been spending um, a lot of time, energy and effort in terms of ensuring that our ventilation systems are, are doing the job that we need them to do in terms of keeping our staff and students safe. Um, we've also been working with principals when we look at our buildings to ensure that we're minimizing exposure in buildings. So including designating some stairways as up or down or taking hallways, ensuring we're helping students and staff understand how do you ensure that physical distance. So many of our school buildings have one foot square tiles on the floor. So it's a great opportunity in my mind to reinforce math skills and counting and helping students count. And we've also used things like stickers on the floor to help students start to visually understand what is six feet of space as you're moving through the building. We've also worked to close our congregate spaces. We really want to ensure we're not encouraging opportunities for people to close that physical distance, right? So looking at not using those congregate spaces and how can we ensure that we're maintaining that physical distancing. And then we're also watching that physical distancing in other spaces like restrooms, again, to ensure that we're keeping people apart as much as we possibly can while facilitating great instruction. And then as you've come to our building, she'll also see new signage in place. We have signage in place reminding people if you're not well, don't come in, as well as we require face coverings and other things like that. Our next category when we look at facilities is cleaning. Um, our cleaning crew has just done an exceptional job and they have been really working hard, not only currently, but all summer. So we have many staff that are in our buildings teaching from our buildings every day and they are diligently cleaning those spaces and sanitizing them every single night. Right. Ever since this pandemic started, we've really paid close attention to how we're keeping things clean. And if you remember, we even increased our cleaning supplies and we were using these ultrasonic cleaners that are also ensuring we're doing additional disinfecting. Um, we're also using additional cleaners to help us in our restrooms, the same things. We're really using a much greater level of cleaning and cleaning more times throughout the day. In order to ensure we're supporting people, we've also, we're in the process of placing disinfectant with microfiber wipes in every single classroom. That gives us the ability to clean. So if you come to central office, you'll see every time someone is meeting at a table, whether it's eating or using that table, if it's a public space, we clean that space when we leave it. So we're really ensuring that we have those supplies in place um, to help people clean in between. We've also increased our cleaning in terms of our high touch areas. We have, um, microfiber antimicrobial covers on every single door handle. And we purchased one for every single door handle throughout the building. That was a great thing Sevi did very early on in this pandemic. And then we also have staff frequently cleaning those high touch points. So making sure that we're wiping doors. We're also being really thoughtful about where can we prop a door open and where can we take away um, additional high point touches that need to occur. When we think of our operations and student health, um, this was touched on earlier. One of the key things in this pandemic is when students return to school, we need to be sure that they've had their immunizations and their physicals in place. So kudos to Rebecca Sharp and her team that have really been working to ensure that students are getting those done so they'll be ready to return to school in a safe way. 
Um, she has also been working with our school health aides to ensure that we have updated health plans on file. So our school health aides have been back and really diligently working to ensure that when students are back, we're keeping them safe. Um, as indicated earlier, we have already placed that request to the health department to have our school nurse come back. Um, thank you, that's, that's a huge important thing as we move forward. And our health clinics have been open and fully staffed. Um, our school health aides have really been doing an excellent job and they're in our buildings helping us as we're providing that supervised learning to our staff students who are in the building. And then the last component on this page, and it's also due to our collaboration with our health department, is ensuring that we have procedures and resources in place. So we know what to do when a staff or student has a COVID-like illness or when the health department contacts us um, in terms of a COVID case. When we think of our procedures in terms of daily health screenings and face coverings, um, staff and students who are above the age of two, um, if it's developmentally appropriate, will be required to wear that face covering, right? And we are taking um, accommodations when there's an ADA or reason for exemption, but we're really working to support the use of face coverings and really promoting that with our students and staff. And, and we have face coverings due to generous support from our PTAs, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, our staff and students are completing a daily health screening. So we've shared with staff, here's all the questions that you need to ask every day. And we've really been encouraging them, if you're not well, if you have any symptoms, stay home, right? And our HR policies facilitating, providing people with leave are really supporting that because we know it's really important that we take good care of each other. And when we return, we need our staff and students to do that because um, that's really one way we're going to keep our exposures um, down. Um, as we work with students, um, we're really going to work to ensure that we're providing with the support and the reasonable accommodations that they need. Right? But we know if we can't be successful, we may have students that we need to serve in an online version instead. But we will do everything we can to make sure our students and staff are successful in terms of doing these mitigation procedures. When we look at transportation, I know I had mentioned previously, in order to provide six feet of space on a school bus, that means we can have one student in every other seat. That provides us with six feet of physical distancing. And Nancy Hendrickson, our transportation director, has come up with a plan where because we have a student in every other seat, when we shift runs, we won't have two students sitting in the same seat. So in between runs, we will do all of the cleaning of high touch areas, but we also have that additional piece in place where we wouldn't have students sit in the same seat. We do know that if we put one student in each seat of the bus, right, that is getting a little bit closer than six feet of space, but those bus seats are high and that will really double our capacity. So that is something that we'll work through as we plan to bring back more students. And then our last category is visitors. We're really working to discourage visitors from coming to our buildings. And we wanna make sure they're coming for scheduled appointments and that they too have completed that health screening and that they're well when they come into our building. And we wanna to work to ensure that we're doing that contactless pick up and drop off. An absolutely great example of that is food service and Richard Kane. His team has developed a wonderful contactless process for families to pick up food each week. So that's just a great example of how we can use that moving forward. When we think of supplies and equipment, we have washable face coverings for all of our students and staff. And that's thanks to the generous support of our PTAs. They've really worked hard to ensure that we have those resources available and those are truly critical for our students. We do have some disposable face coverings as well. So if we end up with a student or staff who comes to school and has forgotten theirs, we will ensure that they or any visitors or vendors who come to our buildings have that face covering on before they enter our building. Um, Sevi Padilla has been working to purchase PPE, which is personal protective equipment. Um, we have um, those masks on hand that I mentioned. We have a good supply of gloves. We're in the process of purchasing gowns that will help. And we also have face shields that we've provided for every single staff. So as we're considering bringing students back to school, we're really proactively working with our staff to ensure that we're providing them with the resources that they need to be safe, right? And we really wanna listen to them and provide the things that they need. The last thing is hand, hand washing and sanitation, sanitizing. We've really been working with students and staff in terms of promoting hand washing. If you remember last spring, we had hand washing videos. We have hand washing signs. We've also been um, putting sanitizer stations in. So you'll see them as well. We really wanna encourage that throughout our buildings. And you'll see things like our drinking fountains where the fountain is covered, but the drinking bottle filler is open. 
So we're really working to ensure that hand washing and sanitation is occurring system-wide. So I believe that is the end of my operation slides. So I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Um, so I would like to go ahead and, uh, and take a pause for some questions and uh, we'll go in alphabetical order. And so I'll be uh, looking at Ms. Downs uh, and then uh, Dr. Dimmick and then uh, Ms. Lynn. Thank you, Ms. Michael. As always, a, a terrific presentation. Appreciate all you've done. Um, two quick questions. One was, um, I, and then correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like at some point I remembered, you know, I've been thinking about the budget and I know we, we just worked on some budget items on Tuesday night, um, but, you know, the budget for all this additional cleaning materials and all that. And, and I seemed, I thought I remembered um, that we talked about maybe that the government side uh, would um, perhaps throw some money our way that they receive from the CARES funding. Um, am I remembering that correctly? Yes, we had made a request in terms of the additional costs that we um, both have had as a result of dealing with this, this pandemic and costs that we're projecting that we will have. So we did make that request to them and we'll continue to work with them in terms of identifying possible funding sources to help us address these additional costs. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then my other question, and I apologize to Dr. Noonan if I'm and Mr. Bates and Mrs. Michael, if I'm getting way ahead of things here, but um, when we had talked about hybrid um, back in the summer, um, we had talked about possibly, you know, one group would go Tuesday, Thursday, one would go maybe Monday, Wednesday. Um, I just, you know, from a cleaning perspective, when we do hit that time where we're going back hybrid, I just didn't know if it made more sense. And again, just thinking of it from an operational perspective, and I don't know, and we don't have to get into this tonight, but I just wanted to throw it out there. If it made more sense to have group A go Monday, Tuesday, break Wednesday for a deep clean, and then group B go Thursday, Friday. So we don't have to get into that tonight. I know this is not for a while down the line, but um, I just was thinking about that in terms of an operation, in terms of a cleaning, um, in terms of the cleaning. Yep. So, we, we did uh, we did raise that just so you know, and it was a, a question that came up and we debated pretty um, heavily. Um, mm -hmm. And the one thing about um, having Monday, when we get to the point that we're in a hybrid and Mondays being a day of planning for teachers, um, the issue uh, around that was if we had students coming on Monday, they would be out of school quite often because Mondays tend to be oh, holidays right. for one thing. Um, and then what um, we realized when I met with Kristen and, and her, uh, her team and through her leadership with her team, the amount of cleaning that goes on uh, at every night would be the equivalent of a deep cleaning, if you will. So, mm -hmm. so those custodial staff that are working in the buildings are going deeply every night. Um, so there wouldn't be substantially more on a Wednesday than there would be on a Monday night or a, or a Thursday night, if you will. Um, and and that is, that's just something that they put in place with their aerosol sprayers and some other things on a, on a routine basis. Okay, thank you, Doctor. And thank you, Michael. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, Dr. Dimmick. Ms. Michael, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, it was great to hear that you can um, put in MERV 15 or 16 filters um, starting in November. Um, I had a couple of questions. One, um, for teachers who would like a higher comfort level on the air quality in their rooms, is it possible to um, purchase true HEPA filters for those um, staff? And then my other question, um, if we do go back to a hybrid model, my recollection from an earlier presentation was that we would need a deeper bench of um, custodial staff. Uh, for sub sorry custodial staff substitutes, and I'm wondering how that is going. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So when we look at our school buildings, um, HEPA filters are substantially greater in cost, and the difference between the MERV um, 16 and HEPA is the difference between about 95 and 99 percent of those items in the air. Um, when we looked at them, not all of our systems will fit HEPA filters because they're not always the same size. 
Um, but we do have windows currently in most of our classroom, which is which is another option in terms of increasing airflow. Um, so we're certainly willing to look at things. Um, we do want to ensure we have the best possible air quality um, in a way that, that we can um, service our current equipment. When we think of our custodial staffing, um, we have really worked in terms of making sure everyone's schedule is working so that we're getting the best possible cleaning each day. Um, when we think of needing substitutes, one of the things currently is without any community use in our building, um, that is providing us with some additional support in terms of cleaning. Um, but as we move forward and open, we will be very conscious of if we need additional staff, where can we provide opportunities to offer additional work to our current staff, and where do we need to hire some other hourly people to help supplement our cleaning. The last component is when we look at our new high school that does have additional square footage and we purchase some additional equipment to help us be more effective in our cleaning. But that building has significantly more square footage and we will need to revisit our overall custodial staffing. Thank you. Um, may I may I ask one more ventilation question? Um, I was thinking when I was mentioning the HEPA filter, I was thinking individual filters for their classroom space. Ah, like the in the small ones that you see people put in a corner, other components. Yes. I can definitely look into that. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, Ms. Litton. Thank you. Um, my first question actually just got answered. It was about staffing. I guess one more piece of that I do have is you talked about cleaning the buses. Is that going to be bus drivers doing that or how are we gonna staff that piece of it? So it will be a task that falls to our bus drivers and our bus aides. So what we'll do is we do our runs in the morning and then we do them in the afternoon. So um, in the morning, once we do our first runs, we'll do cleaning where we're wiping off the high touch areas. We'll have students switch seats and then we'll use those equipment, right? Either the foggers or the electrostatic cleaners and we will completely clean them after the morning runs. Then we will finish the afternoon runs and repeat that process again. So it's gonna be a combination of our bus aides and our bus drivers that will do that work. Um, this current fall, um, while we don't have students in place, one of their additional duties um, is they have completely deep cleaned the buses to start. So we're in a great place and then they'll continue that work going forward. Great, thanks. And I had one other question and I'm not sure if it goes under operations or instruction. But I'm just curious, I know we probably will be encouraging teachers if they're sick not to come to school. So do we have any idea what our substitute supply is looking like, um, both for opening and I'm also curious how we're working that with virtual. If a teacher is sick, do we have virtual substitutes or, or how's that working? So currently in a virtual environment, when we have a teacher sick, we've had other staff people in the building that are providing that coverage um, through a combination of, of both in-person and then recorded instruction. When we think about reopening, you're absolutely right. It's been quite a while since we've had substitutes in our building. Um, so we had um, treated our substitutes, I think, very well in terms of continuing their pay at the end of last school year. Um, so we will reach back out to them and then really aggressively start trying to hire additional substitutes as we begin the year as well. Um, we're really hopeful. Um, we're a great system um, that our substitutes will continue to work for us um, when we have them back in our buildings. But we will also, again, um, aggressively market to get additional substitutes. And, and also to deepen our bench, we've uh, worked with some of the para professionals in the system who have also um, indicated that they had some interest in helping us with substitute positions as well. And then the last piece is um, to, to sort of supplement what Ms. Michael said, we're, we're also trying to build in redundancy across the system. So for example, if a sixth, uh, a bad example, fourth grade teacher um, is, is out sick for a number of days um, and we're in a, a hybrid solution there our first go-to will be to have you know a paraprofessional and then there may be some movement of kids um, to, to create some redundancy so that we've planned for um, when someone is out but we're we're still pretty I, I want to be really clear with the board and the community we're we're still pretty far away from getting to a place where we're bringing lots of kids back but we are 
starting to think about it and um, have identified that, you know, early on that we would look again at the at the quarter. So we're still still working. Great, thanks. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Uh, Mr. Reidinger and then Ms. Russell and then Ms. Snyder. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, thank you, Ms. Michael. Great presentation. I have no questions. Thank you, Mr. Reidinger. Uh, Ms. Russell. Um, yeah, thank you, Ms. Michael. That was a fantastic presentation. And I just had one question, and I guess it's more of a maybe clarification or refresher. What is our current policy with regard to face coverings in our buildings? And I guess what I'm specifically thinking of is I know a number of our teachers are teaching in their classrooms. Um, and I wasn't clear if they're being required to teach in masks or when they're in their classrooms by themselves, if they can hopefully do that mask free, especially to facilitate better communication. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you for asking me to clarify that. Um, when we look at face coverings, if a teacher is teaching in their classroom and they're there alone, they absolutely can take that face covering down, um, providing a better instruction. Um, what we've really asked is that people always ensure that you're wearing your face covering whenever you have the possibility of coming into a contact with another staff person. So while you may be teaching in your individual classroom without your face covering, when you head down the hall to head to the restroom, we ask that you put your face covering on because you may run into someone else in the hall. Um, so we really are trying to be flexible while ensuring people's health and safety. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Uh, Ms. Snyder, I don't know if you have any questions at this point. Uh, no questions at this point, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Webb. I have no questions at this point. Thank you very much for the very thorough presentation, Ms. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, I do have a, a question I'd like to ask um, is part of the, the health screening and the uh, part of the presentation, Ms. Michael. And, uh, Dr. Noonan, uh, taking certainly your point that um, we're, it's still a while before we're having large numbers of students coming into the schools, my question is, do we feel like we have the staff and the equipment to uh, reliably test people's temperatures as they're coming in and the numbers that they will, um, you know, in a timely fashion that gets them in the building quickly enough and with proper social distancing? I, I do think we do. Um, I think it's going to be an operational and organizational challenge for us when the time comes, um, specifically with uh, staggering students through different doors and the like, uh, maintaining social distance. But I think that's the important part of the hybrid that we're only dealing with half the students at, the, at a time. Um, and so that, that piece will be helpful. Um, but I've, I've actually seen it in action um, at a couple of schools across the Commonwealth that have gone back to school in hybrid. Um, and talked with my colleagues from around the Commonwealth and uh, they've been able to do it relatively easily. Okay, that's encouraging to have some, some on the ground data from, uh, from Virginia, that's great. Um, all right, uh, we'll just look to see if there are any follow-up questions. I see Mr. Webb has his hand up. Go ahead, Mr. Webb. Uh, thank you. Um, that what your question just made me uh, think of a question. So when, when we get back to that point, and I, I get we're not there yet, when we do the temperature checks, are we using the handheld thermometers or are we doing something a little different? And I'll just I'll stop there and ask, wait for an answer. We're using the handheld um, infrared uh, okay. thermometers. Okay, and all the reason I asked that question because at um, Bowie, in the student center at Bowie, they have these thermometers where students walk in and I've done it myself when I've gone over there that you actually turn to a, it looks like a tablet and put your face there and it takes their temperature. And I don't know if that's something that you all looked at and maybe would be something that can possibly speed up the process. I don't know, or have it at, some doors to do something like that. I have no idea where they got it from, but I know that's in that particular building, that's what they use before you can enter the student center. It is a, you know, it's almost like you're taking a picture for when you're coming through the airport for when you're coming back through international gates, um, but it's taking the temperature as well. 
Yeah, I, Ms. Michael, have you all, along with Sevi, looked at that? I'm, I've seen the um, the temperature checks that look like metal detectors almost that you walk through, um, but I haven't seen the. Um, yes, this is a facial kind of a facial recognition almost kind of feel that you get within the the lines of the that are on the screen and. Once you're in the right spot, it takes your temperature and you says it out loud what it is, and then you continue on into the building. But that's just a thought within as we're thinking and looking at things. And I have no idea what the cost is. I know we're definitely um, trying to be cost sensitive of, of things as well. But it was just another option to, that I kind of was after seeing those and thinking about those. All right, thank you. Initially, when we were thinking about taking temperature checks, we were really thinking that we had to do it in multiple places, including on each school bus. Um, when the students came in for daycare before school, and at that point in time, it was really difficult to get materials in terms of doing temperature checks. So that's when we invested in the individual infrared touchless thermometers. So we really haven't went back and looked at those um, since we purchased all those thermometers, but we certainly can. Our original thinking was in order to get kids in, we would need to use many doors and we also needed to keep students whose temperature we already checked before getting on the bus, separate from the kids that were being dropped off by their parents whose temperature we had to check at the door. So our, our thinking was more places with a more portable device, but we'll definitely go back and look at those. And that makes sense, but, I, but uh, thanks for the, the thought about the process. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, just go back and make sure that uh, is, are there any other follow up questions? Dr. Dimmick has her hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, in thinking of the temperature taking, who gets to do that? And, um, and do we have staff willing to get right up close to students to do that? So it's really in other duties as, as assigned. We currently have our daycare staff checking the temperatures of our staff's children that are coming in for our supervised learning. And when we look at it on the bus, we'll need the bus aide to do it because we'll want the bus driver to stay on the bus. Um, and then when we think about our school buildings, we're really gonna have to use a large number of people. You know, so we're really hopeful that we're doing this in terms of ensuring everyone's health and safety and that we'll have staff members that will be willing to support us in that effort. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, so, uh, Ms. Downs, you, I don't know if you have any additional questions at this point. Nope, I'm good right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dimmick, I don't know if you have any others at this point either. Okay. No, I'm good, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Litton? Nope. Okay. Um, Mr. Runninger? Still none. All right. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Russell? Um, no, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Snyder? Not right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have nothing further. And Mr. Webb, do you? I do not. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we're, uh, Dr. Noon, I think we're ready to move on to the next segment. All right. The next section is uh, the third and final sort of uh, measure and metric session section that we'd like to speak about tonight, and that's instruction. And I'll turn it over to our Chief Academic Officer, uh, William Bates. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Finally, we get to talk a little bit about instruction. You know, for all of these years, we thought that uh, schools were about teaching and learning. and um, for the educators on, on this thread, uh, we know that in our ed leadership and administration classes, the, they tell us that the most important thing about school operations is safety, the safety of our children and the safety of our staff. And so um, we know that all of the things that were shared prior to um, are critically important in making sure that we have um, smooth operations. Before I jump in um, this evening, you know, I just want to say this, with all of the challenges that, that we faced, uh, one thing that I do find um, gratification, but also confidence in, is the fact that when you have exceptional teachers, when you have strong building leaders and a phenomenal curriculum and instruction team, they figure out how to make instruction work. They're experts in doing the teaching and learning uh, piece or, or, or part. And no matter what the circumstances, no ma matter what the conditions, 
they figure out how to um, ensure the teaching and learning takes place and uh, make sure students have what they need. And so um, I just wanted to say that and I wanted to commend all of our teachers and our um, instructional staff, our paraprofessionals and our school building administrators for a strong um, first few weeks of, of school. So under the instruction umbrella, we focused our attention on two major areas. The first is the master schedule and the second is the instructional learning plan. Under the master schedule, each of our schools will need to build a schedule that allows students and staff to operate with two instructional models. And, and that's really um, a serious challenge um, for us because actually what we're asking our schools to do um, is to actually have two schools operate under one building when we're looking at both the hybrid and the online face-to-face uh, -face model or online model. So some of the drivers and enablers uh, that we've really started looking at have been bulleted on this first slide for you. And so that's making sure that our instructional staff are in place to fully implement both the hybrid and the online model. We're also going to, in our preparation, need to prepare and send out a survey to our parents so we can find out specifically how many students are going to move into the hybrid model versus how many students may remain in the full online model. But we also now need to um, look at any homeschool students who might be returning back to um, Falls Church City Public Schools because we would then have to include them into our numbers as well as create schedules and assign those students to teachers. We have to look at our course offerings that support all of our diploma options. Um, and, and we'll talk about this a little more, but we've shared before that we know that we have students who, um, based upon their course selections over the years, once they matriculate up to the high school, that they are seeking and anticipating a specific diploma. And so we want to ensure that whatever choice they make as far as the models are concerned, that they can still fulfill that uh, diploma option. And then our classroom and course assignments, we need to look at that in the hybrid model versus our current model. And then we need to look at, um, if necessary, shifting teacher assignments, depending upon our student numbers. So this next slide here, is our instructional plan. And that gets a little bit more into um, what we're planning to do with this. And it, it does require some flexibility so that we can effectively and efficiently meet the unique needs of our students. So again, we've teased out some of our enablers, what we like to call them, for the work that we need to do. And so looking at the electives and our IB courses, we have to pay attention to this when we're shifting to a hybrid model because we know that we have some classes or courses that are taught by a single teacher. We have some singletons and um, more specifically some of our electives. And so we have to look at what potential implications may come because of, of teachers who are assigned or one teacher who may be assigned to a course. We have to create the student hybrid schedules. We've looked at our learning recovery plan. We've talked a lot over the past couple of months about um, learning recovery for our vulnerable students, but we know that this is um, important for all students because we have to look at any gaps in student learning or any content that may not have been covered that um, students might need some reinforcing of. And so again, whether you're considered um, to be in a vulnerable population or any of the other populations, we have to ensure that we're doing our due diligence and making sure that our students get what they need. We have to ensure that Encore, the Encore resources and plans are in place for both models. And we have to have an attendance plan for both models. Currently we have our online attendance model, but we would have to look at that model crossing over to um, our hybrid with some groups of students coming in on that Tuesday, Thursday, and others coming in on uh, the Wednesday, Friday. We also talked, we shared um, previously about our 
Aver cameras. We made purchases of cameras that allow us to do live streaming. And so, um, again, considering and considering the move to a hybrid scenario, how might we be able to leverage those um, cameras so that we can provide live, real-time live streaming into the classroom for students who may be at home. And then access to our virtual Virginia outreach, outreach resources. Um, the nice thing about the vir virtual Virginia outreach program, which is new this year, is that it allows our, our teachers to access the virtual Virginia resources. We've shared before that we know we're in the best position when we have the opportunity to have our students be taught by our teachers. And so um, that's our commitment. But with that, virtual Virginia outreach still allows us to access many of the resources that they have that are directly aligned to the SOLs that are interactive. And so we can use those outreach resources to complement the, th the things that we're already doing in our classrooms. And then this final slide here, this gets into uh, our services. And again, whether you're an ESOL student, whether you're a student who has a 504 or a special, ed special education student with an IEP, whether you're receiving gifted and um, you're in a gifted education program and receiving those services, we, we have to make that commitment to ensuring that these services are provided with consistency and fidelity to all students who need them, no matter what program they're going into. And so those are the things that, that we've looked at. We've been able to accomplish um, these things in our current um, model with our virtual, but as we move to the hybrid, whether it's access to in-person assessments in the future um, for our gifted education, or for our ESOL support services. Those are all of the things that we're discussing and building into um, this plan. We have Schoology there at the bottom as our learning platform. Schoology would remain our learning platform in both programs. We've had um, success with Schoology. And so um, we're very confident that Schoology will work just fine in, um, in both models. And Schoology is a platform that we've used for a number of years. And also our curriculum and instruction resources, making sure that those um, resources are in place in both models, um, which, they, which they will be. And I think that might be it for instruction. So at this point in time, uh, Dr. Anderson will certainly take any questions that the board might have with respect to instruction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bates, uh, for your presentation. And yeah, I would like to open it up for questions uh, from the members about uh, about instruction about these particular slides. Mr. Webb, you would be first, and then I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Snyder and then uh, Ms. Russell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Bates, I'm, thank you very much for these uh, for what we actually have all signed up to be doing the education piece of it. Um, Taking a look at this last part of it, particularly with the, the special ed population. And I think we talked about it a little bit earlier. So we are doing what we have to do, but you know, as we look to come back to in person and these, I would hope is still the plan is to be the first students that we would potentially bring back in. Um, with looking at our teachers, have we, Began kind of that conversation with some who specialize in these areas of seeing where where they are and comfort level and those type of things at this point. It looked like Dr. Newton wanted to. Uh, I just was gonna. You've previewed the next section of the presentation, so um, if you if you give us a, a couple of minutes, we'd be happy to. But Mr. Bates, feel free to you can you can give it a high high overview if you want. Yes, yeah, and, and, and we've shared, thank you, uh, Mr. Webb, for, for the question. We will actually, um, in the, the upcoming slides, talk about um, the various populations and some proposed timelines for what the phases for bringing students back um, would be. And so 
you'll see that here um, very shortly. But but yes, we have started having those conversations. And you know, like Dr. Noonan, if we remember back um, to the beginning of the summer, he had shared um, with the board and and with others that um, we have to we have to look at our most vulnerable students whenever we talk about who those um, first groups of students may be that, that come back and get that face-to-face -face instruction. Thank you very much. Sorry for jumping the gun a little bit there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I will will wait on those that next group of slides. But thank you very much for the information of preparing us for what it's going to look like as we potentially look to the, to the hybrid option. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, Ms. Snyder, I don't know if you have any questions uh, related to this most recent chunk. Yeah, I have one question. So you mentioned um, classes where there might only be one teacher or um, classes that are only offered one block and making sure that students are able to get whatever diploma they wanted to um, achieve. Are students going to be taking different classes when they move to the hybrid model or are things going to remain the same? So we, so students, we want students to keep their same schedule. So whatever classes you signed up for would be the classes that you would keep. Um, but what we, what we have to look at is when, as the schools technically what what the schools have to do is build two master schedules. And when we talk, when we use that term master schedule, what that means is we, we would have one group of students who would have a particular schedule with a set of classes and times that they would be in those classes with those assigned teachers. And then we would have another group, one fully online, one um, who's coming in face to face a couple of days a week. And so not knowing how many would be online versus how many would be um, coming in face to face, there could be some shifts, not so not specifically with the course or the class, but potentially with a teacher or with a time of day. So how would that work for classes that are only offered currently in one block, maybe say with like 10 students? or for classes that are specialized encore or elective classes that right. only have one teacher. Right, so we would have to get really narrow and specific with the students' courses. Um, and so, and, and this is probably gonna be more of a secondary concern, so we would talk more specifically at high school, but that could, it, that could potentially look like um, if, if you're taking a particular class and it's um, it's a whether it's an elective or a class that's in a program that only that one teacher in the entire school is teaching. Let's say at, at Mason. Then what that might look like is depending upon the, the availability of that of that particular teacher's time when they can teach the class. We could still allow you to access that class but you could potentially be a hybrid student who's coming in face-to-face -face two days a week. But in order to keep that teacher for that particular class, we might have to ask you to take that class online. Because, and not to get too specific into it, but if, if I'm teaching a particular class and I have, 20, I have 23 students in that particular class, and there's only one section of that class. And if 20 of my 23 students opt to remain online, then it would make sense as the school counselors are balancing out the schedules and as your um, guidance director is um, putting together that other master schedule, it would make sense for that teacher to continue teaching that one course online. So you then as a, a student who chooses hybrid might have to take that, that course online, if that, makes, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And then for the master schedule, will 
students who are taking classes virtually be on the same schedule, like in classes at the same time, but just online? Or will they be following a completely different schedule? Like, would they be on the schedule that we're on right now? Or would they take their online classes differently? So, th so those are things that would be worked out at the, at the school level. And um, again, depending upon the, the number, depending upon the number of students who are online versus the number of students who are choosing to come face to face, especially as you um, matriculate up into like say the, you know, your upperclassmen 11th or in 12th grade, and depending upon which courses you currently have in your schedule, you know, there, there's going to be fewer sections of certain classes available um, for certain students at the at the upper grades versus say a ninth grader who may be taking an algebra two class or a geometry class. Um, and we and your your counselors and the um, director of, of school counseling will have much more flexibility with a student who may be in ninth grade taking a geometry class that has three or four teachers teaching eight sections of it, right? To kind of balance that out versus a 12th grade course that only has one teacher teaching 20 students who are all seniors. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then one more quick question. There are quite a few students at Mason who take classes through the Arlington Career Center. So how do we, I know we don't have any answers for that right now, but is there any thinking as to how that will work out? Yeah, so we um, will continue to work with the, with the um, Arlington Career Center. Um, you know, Mr. Hills and Ms. Snyder um, are, are working in concert with them. And again, uh, the goal has been and will always remain that whatever courses you have right now, whatever classes you're in right now, to the best of our ability, whether you choose that virtual to remain in that model or you choose the face-to-face, -face, if you're doing a dual enrollment or if you're over at the Arlington Career Center, we want you to be able to have, continue to maintain those classes. But there could have, we may have to do some shifting based upon some of the challenges of running two schedules at one time, really under one roof with a finite number of staff to kind of spread across the board. And again, once we have the survey information, we'll know a lot more, but there could, we could face some imbalances with being a, um, a little heavier on the, the virtual side versus the face-to-face -face side or we could be a little heavier on the other side. And so um, it, in a perfect world, if, if I'm teaching a class and I have 24 kids in my class, 12 would choose online, 12 would choose the face-to-face -face, and it would be a clean, um, kind of a clean split. But we know that doesn't, that doesn't always happen. So, but we'll work through all of that. Awesome, thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. Um, I'll move to Ms. Russell and then Mr. Runninger. Um, thank you, Mr. Bates. So I guess these are just two like, more, maybe more clarifying questions. Um, in, I, it's my understanding that there's some classes that were combined as a result of the online schedule. Um, and I'm just curious if there's plans to ultimately split them when they return in person. And I guess, one specific example that I bring up is um, HL Theater three and four are currently combined when typically those are two separate classes. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess just as an add on question to that, is there plans to bring back classes um, that we weren't able to offer as a result of the virtual? And I'm thinking specifically, I guess this was year that they were gonna introduce pottery as an option for electives. So I guess understanding what the status is with those. Yeah. Um, so I, as far as bringing in classes or, or um, kind of building in new sections, so I'll take the second one first, but I'm um, kind of building in new sections that 
Um, we currently aren't offering. We haven't had discussions um, about that. Um, so I, it, at this point, I would say that once we hit that um, end of the first quarter, beginning of the second quarter timeframe, if we're ready to begin um, phasing students in uh, or, or at the semester, it, I wouldn't see us offering new courses that students haven't had an opportunity to sit in beginning in beginning on August 24th, if I'm understanding your, your question accurately. Uh, well, yeah, so I guess in the case of pottery, uh, you know, obviously we probably wouldn't offer it for the semester, but I'm just curious if we would consider bringing it back, say if we were in person next quarter, and then so starting Q3, um, if they would be able to have, you know, bring it back. Or is that, I guess if the, I guess bottom line is if they're not offering a class now, then they most likely won't be offering it once we return in person. Right, right. Especially for a year long class with. Okay. Yeah. If it's a year long class with, um, you know, the curriculum spread out over a year, we wouldn't offer that at the, at a quarter change. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then your, your other question was around the combining of classes. So we're talking more specifically at the secondary level. Um, yeah. So, you know, in the, I guess this case, I'm two classes that I'm specifically thinking of are um, HL theater three and four are currently combined um, when typically those are split out into two separate classes. Um, and then it's my understanding that, you know, some of the champs training classes, you know, are 40 plus kids in there currently now. So I'm just curious when they come back, if they're going to be split out into separate classes. Yeah, well, so that's a great question. We haven't, uh, you know, we haven't reached that point um, yet, but I would say that, you know, sometimes the unintended consequences are positive. And so um, absolutely, if, if there's an opportunity for us, again, depending upon the numbers to decouple a class that's been combined like that, then um, absolutely, that would be something that we would we would try to accomplish, but um, it, it, at this point, I don't have all of the fine details on those specific classes like that. But I do okay. know it's not uncommon to um, to run two courses or have one have a single teacher teach two courses simultaneously. Okay, so I guess bottom line is there is a chance, or maybe more than a slight chance, that when we return to hybrid. Um, and then when we return full time in person, that it could mean some shuffling around of kids' schedules in terms of their times and blocks and so on and so forth. Yes, that's that's right. Okay, that makes sense. So, Thank you. I'm seeing a little body language touching you, and I don't know if you have a comment or a question you want to make on this one. No, I just. Uh... I think you guys ask great questions. I think we're pretty far away from being able to answer them with any kind of um, specificity uh, because there's so much more work that needs to be done with respect to the AVER cameras, streaming of classes, um, figuring out who's coming back, who isn't coming back. And so I, I just would um, caution us about, you know, getting too deep into the details of what it looks like to return at any of the schools because we we still are um, a bit of ways a, a bit away from from that and we certainly would come to all of you with lots of detailed information going forward but I do know that um, one of the things we tried to accomplish in the process of running the online courses was to as best we could run what the day was going to look like when you were either at school or you were at home and so while there may be some shuffling of schedules, I think the intent that we have is to try not to do that too much and to really try to keep the schedules as they are, recognizing that there are a couple of places where there are sort of larger class sizes or, or combined courses. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say in a very long-winded way is we're still a ways away from having a lot of detail about what this looked like. And so if we could just um, maybe uh, give us a little more time to really work on that because we don't have all of the data and information yet uh, that we need to, to put together a good schedule. If that makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, at this point, I'll move to Mr. Reidinger and then Ms. Litton. 
Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, based on uh, Dr. Newton's last comment, um, I, I think I'm going to have to turn my question into a comment, recognizing that I don't think you can answer the question yet. One of the questions I was going to start with is, is the, you know, I think we you presented, a, Mr. Bates, a lot of really great factors. I see you guys are thinking about all of the different pieces. I, I don't really have a sense yet what the the overall schedule is going to look like and the overall approach. And I'm thinking primarily here at the at the GMHS and MEH levels and not so much the elementary levels, um, what the approach would look like and whether you would use um, a, a strategy like had been just talked about this summer uh, where you know the same material would be taught to two different cohorts on two different days twice a week. Um, and I guess I'd say that this is the comment for you to consider in thinking about this. I actually don't see how that will work um, in this environment. I'm not an educator by training and I don't have to do all the scheduling, but it seems to me with the rapidly changing facts that we're gonna have, you know, we need a system that's as simple as possible um, and can deal, and I, this is one of the things I mentioned this summer, can deal with changes. Like we're back for two weeks and then suddenly, you know, we're not in school at all, anybody for two weeks. And so I think, you know, at least for the first semester, to the extent that you can have a schedule that lets you not have separate schedules for online and hybrid, but lets you move seamlessly between the two. And if you have cohorts, maybe don't repeat the same material, but have some people taught um, one set of materials one day with half the class virtual and then a different set of materials the second day with the other half virtual, but they're still in class half the time. That's going to give you a lot more flexibility to adjust to, to changes that come up, whether it's a student who's out or whether it's an entire classroom or in fact an entire city or school system um, that's out. I just, I, I hearing all the different pieces and, you know, I, I worry that the complexity of this is going to be incredibly difficult to manage. And I don't even know if you're going to, if people, you know, if you're going to develop the model after you see the survey, you're going to probably need to do a second survey because people's may answer, people's answers may change based on what the model it is you develop in response to the first survey, because this is all interrelated. Um, so um, I, I guess, you know, without, without taking any particular position. I would just, I'd urge for simplicity and flexibility and avoid whatever complexity um, may be there. Try to reduce it to the maximum extent. Um, and um, I know y'all are the experts at this. I defer to you on the right approach, but um, just with my experience with um, systems and life in general, that's that's the, the suggestion that I would offer. And with that, I'll, I'll cease with no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Um, there's a comment in there and I, I, we'll keep on going. Um, so then uh, uh, Ms. Litton and then Dr. Demick and then uh, Ms. Downs. Um, I, you know what, I think anything I asked would get into detail. So I'm just gonna say, I don't have any questions at this point. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Uh, Dr. Demick. Thank you, Mr. Bates, for your presentation. Um, I actually have a question about um, instruction that's happening now online. Um, I enjoyed the back to school tonight. I think school, at least in my household, started very well. I'm wondering now that we're moving into our third week, how, uh, how teachers at the middle school and high school are doing with their um, with the reduced amount of course time online and and um, sort of can they fit their content in and if they can't fit their content in um, uh, yeah I guess they have to cut stuff yeah yeah thank you for that um, and thank you for the the feedback on on how the school year started <clears throat> you know personally for, for your family yes one of the things that we've talked a lot about um, are those power standards and really, and, and it's included in our learning recovery plan, but really narrowing down um, to what those power standards are and what really needs to be in, be included. Um, 
recognizing that there are many um, things that would be deemed critically important and that need to be taught, but um, having our teachers work collaboratively under that PLC model, one of the things that they've, they've been focusing on are looking at specifically what are those most important key elements that, that need to be pulled out of the curriculum and that students need to get a, a solid, solid grasp on. And um, now that we have moved into to week three, um, we're gonna see that we spent some time initially on the kind of the culture building and, and getting students reacclimated and, and whatnot, but the push is really going to be within that, within that time that we have or, or some of the constraints of the time we have is really narrowing in and lasering in on those power standards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Ms. Downs. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson and Mr. Bates. Uh, it was a great presentation and I wanna echo uh, Dr. Dimmick's comments. Um, our four boys have, um, it's been so smooth and I'm just incredibly impressed with their teachers. So thank you for Everything, um, and I think you're right with you when you started off your presentation. A lot of the reason, you know, we just have such talented teachers and curriculum experts and central office staff. Um, and on that note, and I know Dr. Noonan had mentioned this in the beginning about working with staff. Um, I guess I just wanted to know what um, the plan is to reach out to our teachers as we. Uh, move down the line and start working on this, um, you know, some of the complexities that uh, Mr. Reininger mentioned. Um, I just wanted to, are, will we be serving the, surveying the teachers? How are we going to be getting teacher input on our plans for um, returning hybrid? Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll also ask Dr. Noonan to chime in on this as well. Um, so, you know, one of one of the things we've been we've been having conversations about, and and it's with with the leadership team, but also with our our principals, is um, when not just when's the right time, you know, based upon the health data and based upon the metrics that that we have in place that, that we're looking at, but also um, what supports do students need, but um, also importantly, what supports the staff need to get them prepared for coming back to the building. Um, and, and knowing that the, the workforce or the needed staff is going to be based upon how many students choose to come back face to face. And so, you know, what's the best approach um, to that, but we've had we've be, um, begun the conversations um, with school leadership. And um, we've also had a, a number of conversations with school staff about um, what that's gonna look like, but what supports we can put in place to um, make sure they're safe, um, not just physically, but also make sure that um, the well-being and, and the, um, emotionally and, and, and whatnot that, that there's a, a level of comfort and security in, in coming back to the school. And so, um, I know there that other places have staff uh, had staff surveys go out, which provided them a choice. Um, those are things that we've had discussions on, but uh, right now, I think our primary goal has really been on just work, kind of working hand in hand collectively as an entire division to um, know that we all kind of have to gear ourselves up for when we're back face to face. Thank you. I, I just, um, you know, I think in terms of um, whether it be whatever level it is, whether it be elementary or middle or, or secondary, um, you know, not just the teachers, whether they're coming back or what, but I, I just think, you know, we need to, and I know you all know this, and I'm sure you have plans to do this, but just engaging the teachers and making sure they're part of this so that we have their buy-in so that when, when we are moving to this next piece that they feel like they've been listened to. So that's all, thank you. Absolutely, thank you for that. 
Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, at this point, I think we're going to go ahead and go forward to uh, the next segment of the presentation um, and then uh, final sets of questions on the, on the presentation for the night. So, Dr. Noonan. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to take the last piece of this, which is um, sort of risk versus benefits. And we, you'll see two different, um, two different uh, images there. One is sort of the scales of justice, um, sort of weighing all options, and the other sort of thinking about your inner, your inner core and what are, you, what are you willing to take as a risk um, personally to academically benefit um, our community and our students. So um, one of the things that we're trying to figure out, uh, Ms. Downs, sort of to your question is, you know, where, where are people um, with respect to um, coming back? And so the conversations that we've had have been very, um, very uh, personal and have been um, really one-on-one. -on -one. So um, Chris, if you go to the next slide, um, I, I want to just kind of go back to um, a conversation that you all and we all had um, in July and, and that and call specific attention to um, the line that, that really speaks to with flexibility. It's the second to last line. It says, with the flexibility to bring back special populations of students earlier as circumstances and science allow. And so um, we've had an opportunity now to really think about um, what does it mean to um, bring back a small core group of students um, that are our most um, in need students and provide cohorts of, of students some instruction and some support moving forward? And um, as we've looked at the data and as we've looked at the guidelines that we've received from not only the CDC and the, the WHO and all the groups that we talked about at the very beginning of the presentation, um, we, we believe that um, we can commit to bringing back a very small group of special needs students sooner rather than later um, to really um, help engage them back in the learning process. So if you go to the next slide, Kristen, um, what, what you'll see here is, is um, uh, and let me, let me talk to you just briefly about what the universe of kids that we're talking about is. We're really talking about right now um, about 80 students in the City of Falls Church that have some pretty unique needs that really um, need some extra support um, where the online instruction is really um, not ideal. And I do wanna, I do wanna say this um, because I think it's important to note, we've gotten a lot of feedback from parents that um, they're really enjoying, uh, their kids are really enjoying the online program. So um, it's fascinating to hear multiple perspectives. And so I don't want, um, to be too global in, in conversations regarding, well, on, the online program is not, is not uh, as sufficient as face-to-face -face. because what we're hearing from some of our parents, some of our parents is that it's actually better for some of their kids. But for some of our kids, we also know that it's not better and that there are some um, really unique needs that we have. So We've identified um, a population of students that we would like to consider bringing back sooner rather than later. Um, and the first group that I wanna talk about are the preschool students at Jesse Thackeray. And I'm not talking about the community peers. I'm really talking about the, the Virginia Preschool Initiative students and the students at Jesse Thackeray that have IEPs. Um, I've had an opportunity along with Marie Baruti and, and she is an excellent and awesome leader over at JTP. Um, to meet with the entire staff, um, Marie, and I, and I met with them as a whole staff to talk about sort of what I'm hoping to be able to do uh, moving forward with the division. But I wanted to be super clear with the staff at JTP, just like I wanna be super clear with the staff across FCCPS going forward. And that is that um, we need our teachers to be engaged in the solution. Um, because if teachers are engaged in the solution, then they, they have ownership in the process. And so I put out sort of what the boundaries were or what the tights were. And I asked um, our teachers at JTP to begin putting together a plan that would return the VPI and the IEP students back to Jesse Thackeray and continue to offer um, some program for our community peers. Because when we got into this, um, I did uh, make the promise that we would provide something to our community peers and we wanna stand by that. So currently um, the students at Jesse, or the students, the teachers at Jesse Thackeray and the paraprofessionals along with Marie Baruti have been working on putting together a plan 
um, of how to return the students um, that are VPI and IEP. And in the next week, I'll be meeting with them again to go through the different solutions that they've come up with um, to figure out what is what is workable and how we can make that um, make that happen for um, our preschool students. The second group of students that we um, are looking at bringing back are our special education students on the aligned standards of learning or the ASOL. These are our kids that we would consider our life skills kids that are in K-12. And last week, um, last week or earlier this week, um, I had a chance to, oh, it was, the, it was on Tuesday, had a chance to meet with um, all of the teachers from across the division that teach the ASOL students, the paraprofessionals and, and the principals in the buildings where they are as well as the special education administrators. And my message to them was, we, we really need to find a way to bring back our special education students in the ASOL program. Um, you need to be part of the solution. So please help me figure out what the best way to bring those students back are. And fortunately, um, they've already begun um, starting, putting, starting to put pencil to paper and figure out um, what the best approach is um, to bring back the students. And we'll be talking with them again um, in the next week um, uh, or so to um, begin to flesh out what the final proposal is gonna be. Um, the next group is our special education students in the therapeutic classrooms, grades six through 12. Um, and again, many of those teachers were on the call on Tuesday um, uh, and, and we're very excited to, to begin working with our therapeutic classroom teachers as well. Um, and then we have some students um, in special education with 50% or more services on their IEP grades K through five. Um, some special ed students that are um, are orthopedically impaired, are visually impaired, or are hearing impaired students. And I have not had an opportunity to speak with those teachers yet, um, but look forward to meeting with them to talk um, probably early next week about the best ways that we can bring those students back as well. And then the last group of students for which we are planning to bring back earlier than the um, quarter is uh, our, our critical needs ESOL students and specifically um, those students that, that have the most need and we're working through what that uh, measurement would look like. But again, we need to engage our ESOL teachers because not all ESOL kids, whether they're level one, two, three, or four have the same needs. Um, so we may have some level threes and fours that have greater needs than level one. But um, again, it's not something that we can do without um, our teacher input. So let me tell you sort of briefly what the, the tight parameters were um, if you go back just a second, yeah, what the type parameters were around um, bringing these students back to the teachers when I met with them um, last week and this week. And that was that we are looking to uh, bring our students back um, in some form or fashion, uh, either two full days a week or four half days a week. Um, how, whatever, whatever we can figure out works best for the students and for the teachers and for everyone else. Um, and we're looking at doing that um, on or around the first week of October. Um, so that gives us a little bit of time to finalize the planning, get transportation in place, make sure that we have our returned um, health provider from the county um, because of the nature and needs of the students that we're talking about serving. We, we must have um, our, our public health nurse on board, uh, making sure that our teachers are um, ready to, to roll and our paraprofessionals as well. Um, and then um, with respect to our, uh, the last three on there, um, the special ed students with 50% or more are HI, OI, VI, and critical needs ESOL students. When I meet with those teachers um, later this week and the first of next, it'll be the same sort of loose tight parameters. Um, but we are looking at bringing all of these students back into um, some sort of a hybrid so that they're getting some face-to-face -face instruction back in the City of Falls Church schools. Um, so next slide, Kristen, um, and then we'll wrap it up. And so just in terms of lessons learned, um, you know, we've had a, a fairly successful effort in a variety of places. We've done a great job. I think um, our staff and uh, food services have done a great job with the meal pickup program. Our tech team has been extraordinary um, right on the spot for staff, families, and students. I don't know if you know, but a couple Sundays ago, they did a, a whole sort of almost genius bar approach um, we have started some of our sports practices with limited numbers of students. And that, that reminds me um, of something that I, I, wanna, I wanna be really clear about. 
Um, you've heard, you've heard, and I've heard, and, and others in the community have stated, well, if we can bring sports kids back and private schools can be open, why can't we bring our kids back? And I want to, um, I want to say this, and I want to be as clear as I can. Um, sports programs and going to private schools are choices that parents make and that students make. Attending public school because of the compulsory laws regarding public school is not a choice that parents make. And, and it's not a choice that we make to either bring kids back or not bring kids back or educate, more, more specifically, educate students. So it's not as simple as a parent signing a waiver and saying, I want my kid to go back to school um, we're, we're not going to do waivers um, because we have a responsibility to educate all of our kids. The sports parents have signed a waiver. The private school students have signed a waiver because again, they have a choice to participate in sports. They have a choice to participate in private school, but there is not a choice to participate in education. So uh, as a public school, knowing that we have to educate all of our children, um, we're gonna do what's right when the time is right and when conditions are right. Um, we, we've done a nice job with pro providing learning support for the children of our staff. Um, we have a great partnership with the contact tracing portion of the Fairfax Health Department and uh, monitoring what other programs across the Commonwealth are doing has been very uh, important as well. And some of the additional strategies that we're looking forward to uh, implementing are small group sizes. Again, um, we're really talking about in this first graduated uh, wave, if you will, of students returning, the universe is about 80 students. And that, um, that is also uh, reliant on how many of those parents decide to come back. So as we share what the program is gonna be, um, specific to Mr. Reitinger's uh, point earlier, um, some parents may decide not to send their kids back and some may decide to, to send their kids back, um, but we are looking at um, that universe of about 80. Um, anyway, you can go through the list here. There is one point in here that I wanna make um, really clear to the families that we are talking about bringing back. And that is that um, we would like to create sort of um, in the spirit of uh, professional sports in some ways, a bubble. Um, and that bubble is important to us because we are gonna ask our teachers and our staff to take a risk serving students in our community. And our parents are taking a risk going and bringing their students back into our schools. And so we're asking our staff and our community to, um, to commit to each other to be in the safety bubble. And, and here's, here's where I'm going with that. And that is that um, we, we know what the mitigation strategies are that work to um, keep COVID levels down, wearing a mask, washing hands, not being exposed in large public spaces to other people that are unmasked, not going to parties that are big, um, big events and the like. And so if you commit to sending your child back to school, we're asking you to also commit to be part of our safety bubble. If there is an event that your family is having or that you attend, we certainly wouldn't begrudge you from going to that, but we would ask that you simply report that to us and then take time out from the school and we'll provide you with a different model of instruction during the 10 days that you might be um, doing some sort of quarantine. Um, and so again, we're trying to create that bubble. Um, and while there's no risk-free environment and you see it right here at the bottom, we believe that with intensive mitigation, a commitment to safe, safety and health for our small well-resourced community that we can reduce the risks substantially. So, um, so I'm looking forward to um, bringing, again, that very small cohort of kids back um, and looking at that first week in October. And um, the staff is putting the final plans together of what that might look like. And I want to be flexible with that date. Remember at the beginning, I said, I'm not going to put any date certain out there because things could happen. You know, we're a few days removed from the long weekend. We know that uh, there have been some issues that have come up over long weekends two weeks later. Um, so I want us to aspirationally shoot for that first week in October um, to bring our students back. So here's a timeline of some things that we've been looking at. We've sort of through July, September, um, we've got the reopening metrics tonight. We really want to look, look at um, launching a dashboard for metrics monitoring um, and update that every Monday um, in the next several weeks. Um, we're starting already with the one-on-one -on -one, uh, individual assessments for special education 
um, evaluations and also ESOL screenings. We are looking at offering an in-person SAT uh, in the October timeline. Next slide, Kristen. Um, and then in September, October continued, you know, looking at the health operations and instructional needs that we have um, to make sure that those are in place. And then early October begin offering a small cohort of hybrid instruction and letting that begin sort of our graduated reopening of the City of Falls Church Schools. Then in November, depending on the metrics, this would be the earliest date for us to return to a hybrid um, at, at, for, for any and all levels. Um, and we anticipate um, having some good conversations with staff um, as we move forward um, around what that would look like in the early, October, or early November timeframe. And so we have a bit of a runway um, but um, that's kind of, kind of where we're headed. Um, so next steps, um, principal teacher staff planning support sessions, making sure that we have the staffing that's appropriate, continuing looking at our metrics um, that are in place and then continuing to update all of you uh, as well. So as we, as we move ahead, we will communicate with our um, families that we would like to return in October and they will get a personal phone call um, from um, the school division, letting them know that they are uh, those, those in that um, sort of universe of 80, and that will happen likely in the next week or so. Um, and, and here's one thing we do know, and that is that that idea of balance is really imperfect um, in this period of time. But as we approach this work, um, we just wanna make sure that everybody understands we are gonna continue to use the measures and metrics that we've shared tonight to look at. Um, again, these are uncharted waters. Our pro virtual program for by all accounts has been really good and, and we're excited about what we've been able to put together. We recognize everybody's risk tolerance is different. Um, we're small and we're nimble and that's what makes us special and different. And uh, if we do return in that first week with some of our, our most um, at risk um, students or, or not at risk, but our, our most uh, impacted students, if you will, um, we, will be, um, we will be ahead of the game. And so um, we look forward to, um, to bringing those students back. So I wanna say thank you to the board, um, to our students, to our staff um, for your unprecedented dedication um, to our school division. We know that there are no easy choices during this period of time. Um, we continue to help keep health and safety as our, our front burner item. Um, and right now we need our community support, our staff support, our student support and the board support more than ever. So um, thanks for that. And um, this was a very long presentation. I recognize that um, and uh, appreciate your patience and tolerance as we've gone through it. Um, I think it was important information for all of you to have. And again, just wanna thank the team for their, their dedication in helping pull all this together. Thank you very much, Dr. Noonan. Um, before we go to questions, I would just like to make a couple of observations in response to your last comment. Um, this has been a lot of really good information and really important for us to have the community I have. And so I wanna say thank you for the, the work that went into this uh, and point out that, yeah, it's late, but we still have 50 people watching the live stream right now. So there, there are folks wanting to hear this information. So thank you very much. Um, and the only other observation I wanted to make before I open it up to question is, is tonight is exactly six months from the first night where we had a board meeting in which COVID-19 was really a, a major topic of discussion. So we've been dealing with this for a long time. That's just an observation. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. And again, we'll go in alphabetical order and I'll start with Ms. Downs and then continue on. Uh, Dr. Dimmick would be next and then Ms. Litton. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Noonan and I, um... Completely agree. It was in terms of it was a very thorough presentation. It needed to be long because there's a lot to cover, and it was very thorough. Thank you to you and your team. Um, and again, I, I appreciate. I like um, when you were speaking of specifically our special education staff, but I liked, you know, your uh, phrase having teachers. You know, making sure they're part of the solution, teachers and staff. So I just, you know, hope again that as we move forward towards the hybrid, um, and I know we're not there, um, but that we um, you know, make sure that our staff and our teachers are part of the solution um, as we work towards that, that hybrid model. Uh, and then the um, other thing, and I just lost my, my train of thought, I'll come back to it, but thank you um, very much for this presentation. And um, you know, we're very lucky to have such a strong team in place. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. I'll come back uh, and we'll pick up that train. Um, Dr. Dimmick. Thank you very much for your presentation and all of your hard work. Um, I think it is a very challenging situation because there is a lot of risk and we can mitigate risk, but we cannot guarantee safety. So it's essential that we work in partnership with our teachers and with our families. Um, it may be too soon to tell, but do you think we will have sufficient a sufficient comfort level among our staff to bring back these 80 students? So um, based on the conversations that I've had with um, Jesse Thackeray and um, some, of the, some of the staff from Thomas Jefferson and at um, Henderson and at GM, I, I do. I think that um, we have some excitement and some enthusiasm that's been building um, to bring um, this very small cohort of students back. Um, I think we also need to be flexible with our staffing. Um, and so an example of that might be um, if we need four teachers and we've got three teachers and four paraprofessionals, what we might need to do is, is move one of those paraprofessionals into a substitute role um, or look at how we might be able to utilize the resources across the division that we have effectively. So if we need one more special education teacher to pick up a a preschool class, for example, um, and, and someone just says, I, I can't do it, then we would go out to the system first and ask the system, um, those that are here that teach special ed, would someone like to, to take a, a class of preschool students? Um, and, or, you know, that's another example of how we might utilize our, our staff that are available. Um, my hope is that as we put together these plans together in, in conjunction with each other, people will feel more comfort um, knowing that uh, there are a variety of ways that we can do this. And, and one of the things that I've been really clear with the faculty on is that one, we wanna do, we wanna be as creative as we possibly can, um, not only to serve as many kids as we can, but also to provide a level of comfort to our staff to feel good about coming back. So one of the things that I did not say from the, from the jump, um, even months ago, was that you're gonna bring kids back five days a week. Um, because I think that, I think we need to be flexible and more flexible than that. And, um, and, and knowing that um, that's not a mandate and it could be on offer if, if the teacher said we'll do it, um, but knowing that that was not a mandate was certainly helpful to the teachers to begin thinking a little bit more creatively about what it could look like. And then the last piece is I, I've also shared with them, we will um, do whatever it takes to provide the appropriate PPE. Um, so if you're more comfortable um, with a face shield and a mask and um, a, a, a doctor's coat or a, a smock or, or scrubs or whatever, we'll, we'll get you what you need um, because we, we're ready to put some resources towards this um, to make sure that we can get our um, students that have the most needs back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, Ms. Litton. I don't have any questions, but just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Noonan and the staff. I think all of us on the board have heard from a lot of parents um, about about kind of the issue, the special ed issue. So we really appreciate you taking that on. I know it's not easy, um, but I do think all of us, you guys more than anybody wanna know that every single day a kid is receiving an education. Um, you know, and I think some of those parents have felt like their child just couldn't access it. So I think that's great news. And I think from what I've heard generally across the um, district is that parents are really happy with the online education. For most kids, it's going really well. So um, I, I think we're overall in good shape. Um, I think it's great getting those special needs kids back. So thank you for everything. Thanks for the presentation tonight. It's been great. Thanks, Ms. Sutton. I think one of the reasons that I wanted to um, go back just quickly to the, to the comments that and the, the um, the statement that the board made was that we were we were thinking about this group of students in July, 
Um, so, so we've been trying to, to um, work with the staff since their return um, in late August to find ways to be able to do this. So um, we're, we're excited about the possibility. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Uh, Mr. Reininger. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, no, no questions, just also my thanks. Uh, clearly, um, a lot of work has gone into uh, trying to deal with the pandemic by uh, a collection of people who are educators and, and not epidemiologists. So um, just, I, I think some honorary degrees could in fact be awarded pretty quickly. Um, thanks very much. And in particular, I'd like to say, um, I strongly support the decision that the staff and you, Dr. Noonan, are making about bringing back a, a small cohort of special needs students as early as possible. I think um, Ms. Litton and others have talked about that, but it's, it's exactly the right thing to do um, in terms of trying to give every child an appropriate public education. So I, I appreciate it. And, and again, thanks for the effort. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Um, Ms. Russell. Um, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I guess this is probably directed to Dr. Noonan. With regard to the small cohort of the special education students, um, I guess two things. First of all, is there anything, I guess, that would that we could do to, I guess, accelerate the timeline? Or I guess, is there any one specific aspect that's kind of pushing us out into early October? Because I know in talking with these families, you know, they definitely want to get their kids back as soon as possible. And obviously we do too. Um, so just trying to understand, like if, if there's any one single factor um, that is stretching the timeline out a little longer. Um, and then second of all, I guess, along those same lines, is there anything that you can identify that would, I guess, cause a hiccup and push the timeline out further? Um, because I think that one of the key things that's gonna be very important with regard to this process is making sure that we are regularly and clearly communicating to those families and setting their expectations. So, you know, we're not telling them three days before, you know, we can't make it happen. Um, so to the extent possible, making sure that we're keeping in the loop and continuing to keep them up to date on where things stand. Sure. Um, so there's a couple of things that, um, sort of inhibit the timeline acceleration. Um, one is, you know, the first of next week will be the 14th of September. So we're really only a, a few weeks out to begin with. So it's not, um, it's not very long getting to that first week in October. Um, this, so, so that's one thing just in and of itself um, because it does have operational implications, transportation, transportation routing, food services, uh, making sure that we have the appropriate meals uh, planned for the sites where our students are going to be, uh, making sure that we have the full staffing uh, available to us. If there is some flexibility that's going to be required to bring other staff members from other schools in who, who say that they will do this work, uh, we just need a little time to um, finalize that. Um, and then another big driver for us is, again, sort of the nature and needs of the students that we're talking about serving um, are, are kids that typically have health plans that go along with their IEPs. Um, and we have to have that public health nurse back uh, from the county. Um, I know that there's been some conversation um, sort of in the community that I've gotten wind about, about privately funding perhaps a, a public health nurse that could come in. Um, and, and to be perfectly honest, I, I, I don't, think that that would be at all, um, one, a, a good use of our time trying to, um, you know, interview public health nurses that will be here for about two and a half weeks that would, by the time they're fingerprinted, give us print, fingerprinted and cleared by HR, that would ultimately give us about a week of coverage before the public health nurse got here. At, and that's on a fast time frame. Um, and we have a good relationship with the county um, and they fund our public health nurses. And I would hate to get into a circumstance where um, we run afoul with um, someone we have a nice relationship with. Um, so, so those are some of the factors that I think would um, in, in, inhibit us from e extending or speeding up the timeline. With respect to your second question about what could extend the timeline, um, I, I think a spike in, um, a, a massive spike in infection 
could um, theoretically really throw a, a wrench in our plans. Um, and we are looking at data now and we've shared it with you and, and we know that this population is, is different and we are um, not following exactly our protocols with respect to the data that we're using to reopen schools for 2,700 kids because we're talking about 80 kids um, across five different buildings. So they're really small. Um, but if there is a large spike in um, coronavirus, there's, there's the potential that um, families might decide, you know what, I'm, I'm not ready to do it, or staff might, um, might push back. Um, but it really does put us in a, a, a rather difficult situation, um, to be perfectly honest, when, when our staff um, potentially could say, we, we don't want to do it. Um, because then we're really talking about repurposing other people and swapping positions first um, before we before we have to go down a, a different path. And we certainly don't want to have to go down a different path if we don't have to, because we've got great teachers and we want to hold on to them. So I think those are a couple of things that could um, slow us down. Okay, great. Thanks. I have just a couple more questions. I know it's getting late, so I'll try and keep on brief. Yeah, sure. um, but I guess one thing that I just wanted to throw out there as a suggestion is to consider doing some sort of climate survey, I guess, for the kids and the parents and the staff. Um, and I guess specifically, I have to say that, you know, based on my conversations with the community and to some extent, some staff members, I'm concerned about their mental health, um, especially the parents. I think that this is putting a tremendous strain on everyone. And I mean, again, I know, you know, we are obviously doing the very best that we can and your team has been doing tremendous outstanding work under, you know, untenable circumstances. So that's very much appreciated and in no way is it directed at you, but I do think it would be good to just kind of get a sense of how our community is doing and how our kids and staff are doing, um, just hanging in there. Um, and I'm not sure what we necessarily do with that information, but it might be helpful, you know, just with regard to any kind of mental health workshops or things that we're looking at um, going forward. So, and I guess the last thing was a request as well. Um, at the beginning of the school year, you had provided us some fantastic stats on attendance and I guess and people logging in and what those look like. And I think, I guess I personally as a board member would love to see those from time to time in just terms of how they've progressed or changed over the last couple of weeks and also going forward. Um, so I don't know if it's just a random, you know, pick a day during the week or how it would be best to do it, but just to get a kind of sense of, you know, is our attendance going down or less people logging in? Is it going up? Is it staying steady? Um, and also between the different schools and grades. So okay. Okay. thank you very much. You. I'll ask Mr. Bates to help, help me with that second request specifically. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Um, Mr. Webb. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I definitely um, want to echo some of the, the comments of my colleagues. Uh, thank you, Dr. Noonan, and to the, to the team for being able to work a plan to bring the students back to school as soon as possible. I think uh, the plan that you all have laid out tonight is a very thoughtful plan that um, gets these kids back in as soon as possible. Um, happy to hear that uh, if without any hiccups that we could be have those students back in within the next couple of weeks. And I think parents that I've talked to in the community are going to be very excited um, for that opportunity to do that. And I thank you and the staff for for, for reaching out, working this plan. And, and you're right, you all have been working on this plan for a while and it's happy, I'm happy to hear it actually being laid out in a very workable um, way. Also, um, just more on a personal note, um, thanks to you, the teachers and everyone who have gotten these last couple of weeks off to a very strong start with the virtual school. Uh, speaking from experience of my sister who lives downstate and they started school on Wednesday in Nottoway County. 
my niece wasn't able to log on day one of, of school. So uh, they, it's definitely some technical issues where the school issued laptop was not working, but today's school by using her own personal laptop and Chromebook, she was able to log in. So uh, I'm very happy that we got off to a very strong start and kind of worked out some of those things because we were a little quicker of making that transition um, and learning from what happened in the prior times. But, um, but with that, uh, no real questions, but again, I just wanna thank you all for all the hard work that you all are doing and happy to hear that we are starting to, to bring in, uh, in the next couple of weeks, some cohorts of some of our uh, students who need that in-person instruction uh, for them. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, Ms. Downs, I believe, uh, had another comment she wanted to make. Yeah, I, I remembered it. It was a, just a quick thank you. Uh, to Dr. Noonan and Ms. Sharp for uh, providing a semi um, firm, if everything goes according to plan, um, date to bring our um, special education population and our other vulnerable populations back. Um, I think having a date granted, you know, we, we still have to keep our fingers crossed that everything um, stays as it is or improves. Um, but I know that the couple special education families I've been talking to having um, a semi, you know, actual date um, really puts a lot of their um, concerns and angst and frustration um, really helps with that a lot. So thank you for that. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Are there any other comments from, uh, from members? Not seeing any at this point. Um, I'll just kind of wrap things up with a couple of my own comments. Um, I also am very grateful and want to say thank you to Dr. Noon and to you and to your entire team for the um, for the detailed presentation and for more than anything the caring and the work that went into it and the and the work behind it. Um, and we, I echo my colleagues. You've done a tremendous job, um, and I'm very grateful personally for that. Um, on the I, I really do support as well. My colleagues, again, I support the plan to bring back um, uh, our our most impacted students as soon as we as soon as we can, realizing that there are some uh, practical constraints that we're dealing with. I think Ms. Downs is right that having that date, knowing that there is still you know the potential that things could go wrong, but hopefully uh, having that date gives some level of reassurance. But I also really like the the fact that. Um, the attention that's being paid to the fact that the, the different groups have different needs, um, our staff have different needs, our, um, you know, going and asking them what kind of PPE do you want, right? That's just one level of that sort of detail, talking to our staff, talking to our teachers and understanding all of that. Um, so it was brought home to me uh, um, recently, I was able to attend a parent support group for uh, students with special needs and uh, Ms. Sharp was there as well. And, uh, one of the things that struck me throughout is even within this group of parents all reaching out um, to each other for support and, and really trying to get what they, they, their kids need, um, you know, and, and going through that, even through that, there wasn't uniformity. There was a lot of variability in what people wanted and needed for their children. And so the fact that I think the phrasing we've used before is by name and by need is really coming in in this case. And I think that's really important. Um, I'm very glad that, that we're able to do that. Um, and I hope that I hope that this news um, brings some reassurance to those families that, that that kind of individual need is really being taken very seriously. So thank you um, again for all of the work and, uh, and for the presentation tonight. And, and I just will end by, by rem <laughs> remarking again, it has been exactly six months since our meeting on March 10th. And um, that's, uh, it's kind of an amazing amount of time. So thank you. Um, looking around for any final thoughts, then we, uh, we do actually have some other business that we need to finish um, for tonight's agenda, uh, but there's not much. Um, we'll move on to I item eight on our agenda, which is future agenda topics. And, and really tonight, what I wanna do is remind everyone that 
uh, at our September 22nd work session, um, we have scheduled uh, a discussion of our equity efforts uh, division wide, the division level team, uh, as well as uh, as well as the other efforts and uh, discussions of curriculum and so on. So that's uh, September 22nd. And just ask if there's anything else anyone is burning to raise as a future agenda item at this point. Mr. Webb. Uh, just tagging on to what you were talking about and just uh, asking the staff if they could within that um, equity update, um, talk a little bit about the information I shared with uh, a couple of folks about some of the HBCUs and possible relationship creating with them on uh, possible recruitment and other ways we can start developing a pipeline for a little bit more diverse um, teachers, administrators, what have you in the, here in the school system. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Webb. I see Mr. Bates nodding, so I think that'll be part of the plan. Thanks. Um, and I will mention one thing that Ms. Snyder had brought up, and I, I think this is, would also be uh, wise for that discussion, is the, the best that we can to bring in the student voice. And I know that there's the Students for Social Justice at the middle school and then the student, the similar organization at the high school level, trying to do what we can to bring in those voices directly would really be a benefit, I think. Um, not sure exactly what that looks like, but it'd be good to do, talk through that. Are there other future agenda items that anyone wants to bring forward right now? I would like to, I don't know where it's coming in, but I think we need to talk about um, the timing of the school calendar. I didn't mean to throw a curveball at you, Chair Anderson. It's like Superintendent 101, don't surprise the chair. Um, could we put that maybe in, as a pin um, at some point so we could, uh, I don't know if September's right, but at least maybe October. Um, certainly, and uh, and that isn't a violation of uh, 101 because that's certainly been on my mind anyway. So uh, we're we're in sync there. Uh, yes, that's certainly something that we need to talk about. Um, there was, among other things, um, the discussion of having perhaps longer calendars, a two-year cycle, maybe even a three-year cycle, that sort of thing. So yes, um, that would be very much appropriate. Um, okay. So all right. Um, Next, we'll move on to, to uh, item nine on the agenda, the superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, I don't have a whole lot tonight. I know you'll be pleased by that. Um, so just believe it or not, uh, this is about the run for the schools. Um, this weekend is the annual run for the schools. It's virtual this year and runners are encouraged to uh, run it alone, walk it with friends in a socially distanced group. Um, there will be fun media, uh, social media posts along with um, other, other fun activities. So if you want to post at hashtag virtual FCEF run 2020, uh, and that'll, we'll, we'll get that also out. Um, whether you're a runner or not, please participate um, as the kickoff fundraiser for um, the Ed Foundation. Um, and you can get your packet, t shirt, and pickup um, Friday at the State Theater. Uh, virtual back to school nights. I know uh, the other night we had meet the administrators at George Mason High School. It sounded like that went. Uh, very well. And we also had Jesse Thackeray back to school. Of course, tonight was Mary Ellen Henderson's back to school night. Uh, it sounds like it went pretty well as uh, also. Um, the 16th is Mason's High School. Uh, Mason High School's back to school night. September 17th is Thomas Jefferson's back to school night. And the 23rd is Mount Daniels. And then lastly for me, um, on supply pickup ordering, um, the teams at all of our schools, including many PTA, PTSA volunteers and staff have packed thousands of bags of books and supplies for parents to pick up for their children. Elementary preschool students uh, will, will receive their math manipulatives as well. So just wanna send a big thank you out to all the volunteers who did a ton of work um, lifting, uh, of heavy lifting around the supplies. So, so thanks to all of them. And that's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, any questions for Dr. Noonan on the report? Okay, not seeing any, we'll, we'll uh, move on to um, board and student liaison comments and I'll just uh, go in alphabetic order to make it simple. Uh, Ms. Downs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. Well, Dr. Noonan stole my thunder. I was gonna report on uh, <laughs> Mary Asel's report, they, they uh, gave 300 volunteer hours to distribute 
uh, Mason textbooks. And, um, you know, and I know that the MEH PTA and elementary PTA did the same at their schools. And uh, Mary just wanted me to remind, especially Dr. Noonan and Ms. Michael, that, you know, the SAOs are standing by and they're ready to help out with, you know, health screenings. You know, I know they're helping with the mask, but, you know, please call on them um, to lend a hand. Uh, the only other report I have is I participated in the uh, Parks and Rec meeting uh, a few nights ago, and there was a presentation um, regarding the commercial aspect um, that's going in next to the high school. And um, there was some talk at the very end about just making sure we're clear that the, the um, people who are living in that area that they understand when they can access school facilities. So um, this is something Dr. Noon, I'll, I'll get in touch with you um, offline, but just to, to be clear, um, the Parks and Rec Board was, was concerned. Um, they wanted to make sure that um, it was known that the schools have first priority, then Parks and Rec, and then residents who are moving into that new development. Um, they were concerned that the way that it was being promoted was that residents of this new development would have all access to fields and things, you know, and so this is something we can talk about, but I just wanted to put that out there. So um, Parks and Rec, the board is looking out for, for the schools and making sure that, that uh, the developers aren't over promoting the access to our facilities to those new residents that will be moving in there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Uh, Dr. Dimmick. I don't have anything to report. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Litton. Nothing to report. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reininger. Nothing to report this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Russell. Um, thanks, Chair Anderson. I just have a quick report from the athletic boosters. Um, as we all know, the, they have some return to sports going on. So they have preseason practices going on for their season one, which is the winter sports. Um, so which apparently winter sports now includes cross country, which I'm interested to see how that goes. Um, but cross country and girls basketball started last week and then boys basketball and girls volleyball will be added during the week of September 21st. Um, and then they also have an ongoing strength and conditioning workout at the stadium that's open to any Mason student. And I believe that that was included in the morning announcements this morning as well. And you can find additional information on the masonathletics.org website. Um, and to echo Ms. Downs' sentiment, um, the athletic boosters also wanted to make sure um, that Dr. Noonan and staff knew that the athletic boosters are standing by um, happy to help with any health screenings, requirements for practices, um, and that really anything that you need assistance with, um, and you know they are happy to help. So please keep them in mind for any additional manpower that you might need that, that would be appropriate to use their services. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Uh, Mr. Webb. Uh, no report tonight. It's just Dr. Noonan already mentioned about the run for the schools this weekend, but so no additional report for tonight. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll just uh, report that I attended the uh, latest Chamber of Commerce board meeting on Tuesday um, and, uh, and talked a bit about uh, tonight and a bit about the metrics that we were going to be rec uh, receiving the presentation about. And the possibility that some of those may also be applicable for uh, local businesses. So um, I promised to send them the copy of the, uh, the video uh, when, uh, when that was presented. So I'll take care of that. Um, and, uh, and otherwise, uh, nothing, uh, nothing further that I want to report tonight. So, all right. Um, with the last item of business on the agenda is uh, we do have three sets of minutes um, to approve, and normally we uh, uh, normally we could do a unanimous consent, but at electronic meeting we can't. We do need to do a roll call vote. Um, but I am assured uh, that we do have the ability to do it as one vote uh, for all three. So um, I would seek a motion regarding the approval of the minutes. Ms. Downs. Chair Anderson, I move that the school board approve the minutes of December 17th, 2019, June 30th, 2020, and July 14th, 2020 as presented. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Uh, Ms. Goodell. All right, Dr. Anderson, 
Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Uh, Ms. Downs. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. And Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's. Uh, we have now reached the end of our uh, end of our business on the agenda, um, and I am looking to see if anyone has any final comments or questions or thoughts before we adjourn. Not seeing any, uh, we stand adjourned. And thank you very much uh, for the meeting this evening. Good night, everyone. <laughs>